Welcome to the third episode in our special five-part series celebrating the Brian De Palma thriller. Tonight, we look at Dress to Kill with special guests, author and critic John Kenneth Muir, actress Nancy Allen, actor Keith Gordon, and producer George Leto. Coming up next on Movie Geeks United. Bobby, you won't see me anymore, so I'm going to have a little session with your machine. Oh, I borrowed your razor, and... Well, you'll read all about it. Some poor zombie, but I'll get her. I've already been to the police, but I didn't tell them about Bobby. I wanted to talk to her first. Brian DeFalco, the master of the macabre who shocked audiences everywhere with Sisters, Carrie, Obsession, and The Fury, now invites you to a showing of the latest fashion in murder. <coughs> dressed to Kill. Michael Caine, Angie Dickinson, Nancy Allen. Dressed to Kill. Murder. Made to order. Welcome to the show tonight, everybody. Hope you're having a great evening. All three movie geeks are here. My name is Jamie. And my name is Jerry. <laughs> and my name's Chris. <laughs> that was great, guys. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us tonight. Uh, Chris, um, I wanted to, since, since this is the first uh, episode of this series that you've been a part of, and you've heard the previous ones that we've done, the previous two, I wanted to get your input on, on what your impressions are of the series and the guests and, and the films that we've been discussing. Any thoughts that you might have? Well, uh, yeah, I have thoughts, uh, although you guys <laughs> already raised – you raised most of them already uh, in the uh, in the two shows that you've done already. A lot of great points, a lot of great uh, interviews, especially uh, – what's his name? Muir? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. The critic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I love the conversation. You know, I can listen to him talk uh, about the Palma all night long. I feel like we should have him on when we talk about uh, every director, particularly in the sci-fi and horror genre. Uh, That's just it, yeah. You know, we're doing it. We're going to do a horror series next month on five or six of the top, you know, of you know, iconic horror films. And I'd love to have him back on for that, for Halloween kind of time. Yeah, it's nice to have a critic who doesn't come off as who just comes off as uh I mean, I don't want to make him sound like he's not a cerebral guy, but it doesn't come off sounding like some scholar or something like that. It just sounds like a guy uh who's well educated in, in film history but also just a regular movie watcher and a uh, regular lover of movies. Yeah, just there's like nothing that. there's nothing stuffy about no, nothing. His insights. Right, it's right. all it's all love and appreciation of movies. Yeah. Right. So, how long has it been since you've seen Sisters, Chris? Oh God, it's probably been six or seven years, and that was the first time that I saw it. I rented it uh, back when we used to have video stores that had video tapes. Uh, mm-hmm. When I would go to the beach with my family, I was there was a great little independent video store over there that just had thousands and thousands and thousands of old movies and that's where I was able to see a lot of old, the old De Palma movies uh, yeah. you know the stuff that you couldn't find anywhere like Freak and Sorcerer they had on VHS you know that gives you an idea of the kind of deep shells that they had uh, you know they had Phantom of the Paradise on VHS they had, wow. Sisters, they, had a, they had Obsession they had High Mom you know like deep shells in this place so Naturally, it's closed now, and I don't have a VHS player, and neither does anyone I know, but that's when I first saw Sisters, so it was probably about seven years ago at that place. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting movie. Sisters is not, I'll be honest, Sisters is not one of his movies that I go back to over and over again. I think I've seen it uh, 
just the one time, and uh, I don't. Uh, I liked it very much. It's just not one of the ones I gr- sort of grew up watching. I really did grow up watching, especially uh, Dressed to Kill and Body Double and Raising Cain. Mm. Probably the probably the three biggest uh, that I watched over and over and over again. The uh, yeah. sort of class, very De Palma e uh, trilogy of those uh, three movies. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, uh, yeah, let, let, let me set up the movie for tonight, which is Dressed to Kill, and then, then uh, we can discuss a little bit before our first interview, our, our thoughts on it. Um, Dressed to Kill stars Angie Dickinson in, in what she considers her favorite film role that she ever did. She plays Kate Miller, a sexually frustrated middle-aged housewife who is brutally murdered following an unfortunate one-night stand. Keith Gordon, who's with us tonight, plays her son, a tech geek named Peter, who enlists the assistance of Liz Blake, played by Nancy Allen, also with us tonight. She plays a high-priced call girl who witnesses his mother's murder, and together they have the intention of finding the murderer, and their investigation leads them to Kate's psychiatrist, played by Michael Caine, and a great performance. And uh, his character is, is much, much more than he seems. (laughs) Uh, and uh, you know his character actually was the point of controversy in the film I mean the film is this lurid thrill ride from start to finish and it's got scenes of intense suspense and sexuality but critics were divided on whether to praise the film for its energy and visual bravado or condemn it for what many of them viewed as misogynist or anti-gay uh, but what those critics missed, I think, was what's hidden kind of beneath the surface, which are all the characters, every single one of them, are grappling with their sexual identity in one form or another. Yes. That's a great, yeah. that's a very good point. I mean, I yes. couldn't agree more with that. And I think another aspect that makes people uncomfortable with the Palmas films is that he does deal with sexuality. It, in a, in a I, I think a, a meaningful way, but but also it does add to the lurid nature of his work. I think it makes some people uncomfortable, like they can just yeah. wag wag their finger at him and say, "You dirty little boy." Yeah, uh, Dress to Kill is a very sexual movie in a lot of different ways. Uh, it deals with the sexual desires and proclivities and interests of of women and men, and somewhere in between as well, uh, and uh, it also deals with, like, weird, weird fears that we have about sex and the weird mm-hmm. uh, repressed desires that we have about sex. Uh, it's one of the things, like, the, the entire Angie, did, like, this is sort of one of the things that people complain about him, is that uh, he doesn't uh, create interesting female character, or he doesn't create, uh, you know, sympathetic female characters or, or, or well-rounded female characters, but... Uh, I would argue that he doesn't really uh, create well-rounded male characters very often either. Uh, very often, his movies have a kind of a, uh, an overstuffed, uh, like sort of sort of characters on steroids. Yeah. They're sort of car- caricatures on steroids. Like they're just uh, the cops in his movies are cops, and that's what mm-hmm. they are. That's all they do. He's a cop, you know. The, and the women in the women in his movies are are women. They're like a woman on steroids. They're like every they're ultra feminine. The men are ultra macho, uh, oftentimes. Not always. These are not always the case. But uh, I love the way I love I love the way he sets these sort of sexual traps in Dress to Kill, especially with the Angie Dickinson character. Mm-hmm. She's sort of wandering through the. Mm-hmm. Uh, wandering through the uh, museum, sort of mm-hmm. following this guy after she's just had this whiff. The entire character has nothing but sex running through it. Like, she has this <laughs> rape, yeah. rape fantasy at the very beginning of the movie. That's followed by this weird scene where she's following around this guy, or maybe he's following her through a museum, uh, and there's weird sexual tones there, and then she hops in the car and goes and, and does, you know, does the deed with him, and then, oh, shit, he's got a venereal disease. And, and you know, like... The whole the whole sexual angle throws you off from the fact from the fact that a murder is about to take place. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like people read too much into the Palma movies. I feel like oftentimes it, it, it's 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 face value. It's uh, mm-hmm. it, it really isn't meant to be read into too much further than that. It's like oh I want to have sex, but oh you can get a venereal disease. Like that's all there is to it. Like 
Well, you see that in you see that dynamic, and we talked to about this to John. You see that dynamic in a lot of horror movies, and it's been thrown particularly at a movie like Friday the Thirteenth. You know, you're promiscuous and you pay for it. You know, right, right, uh, yeah. But there, it is it is done in it is done in a very special way at De Palma's films because you know she she has this moment of release with him. She finally feels like she's coming to her own after so many years. You're led to believe of a boring, sexless kind of exciting mm-hmm. marriage, um, and and uh, then she's stricken with fear after she sees the doctor's papers that say that he's been treated for a venereal disease. And then in that panic, that's when she gets in the elevator and she's murdered. There's right. something deliciously nasty about, it's about so nasty. De Palma. Yes. Put it in mildly, I mean. In, oh a J- in a Friday the 13th movie, you're promiscuous and so you die. In a Friday the Palma movie, you're promiscuous and you're going to die, but first you get a venereal disease. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's just great. I love that dynamic. It, it, it's his dark sense of humor. I mean, his really kind of nasty, <laughs> down to the bone sense of humor that comes out. And it serves two purposes. It also throws the audience off. You get all yeah. caught up in the sexual act that's going on, and when that murder comes, I would yes. argue that you're when she's wandering around in the museum, you're sort of thinking murder then, but then it's mm-hmm. like sex, 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 and that all throws you off. <laughs> you know, it's nothing but sex for the next twenty minutes, and that throws you off. You're not expecting the murder when it finally does come. It throws you off. Yeah, I agree. And uh, plus, there's other things that we discuss in these conversations. How kind of special it is that there, it opens with a with a middle aged. I think it is uh, unique that you know she's a middle aged woman who Absolutely. who's ha- who wants to have this kind of affair. It's a late stage kind of sexual blooming that she has, and right. um, obviously. You can point to a psycho influence because it's who you're led to believe is the main character that's mm-hmm. off in the first act. There's also the, the the inspiration behind the movie. It's been said is uh, from De Palma's life. Um, his father was having an affair, or his mother was. His father was having an affair. His father yeah. had, a, yeah, his father had a lot of affairs. Um, I think. And his mother sent him to uh, spy on them and. And uh, bring back proof, like uh, take photos and things. And to record them, yeah. 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 So he he started out as a voyeur. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's yeah. the whole thing. I mean, that's this movie and the whole movie. But, I mean, it's obvious that Keith Gordon is the Palma in the movie. I mean, the computer right. techno geek. I mean, I, was, I watched it earlier today again. Um, it's the only one I've watched recently for this show. Um yeah, I mean, there's a lot. Everything that you guys say is true, and I think Chris brings up a good point. The, the male characters are just as, um, they're just, they're not char- they are caricatures. They're like, you know, as you say, caricatures on steroids. Um, yeah. I mean, look at the Dennis Franz character. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look every. And, but every but look at that, look at that one, and, um, I, but I would say, actually, though, to be fair, he does give the Keith Gordon character um, more than the others, but just slightly yeah. more. Slightly, um, not a lot, but Nancy Allen. I mean, well, um, <laughs> well, they all they all they all serve a function. And yeah, if this mo- if this movie is about uh, sexual identity, uh, I mean, Keith Gordon's at his own awkward mm-hmm. uh, stage. Uh, Nancy Allen uses her sex for a particular re- goal. Right. Mm-hmm. Michael Caine's conflicted. Angie Dickinson. That's uh, we, just des- we, we just described her journey. I mean, everyone fits into their own little place in right. the, the themes that this movie is dealing with. Yeah. And what I like about this series... Go ahead, man. Go ahead. Sorry. His movies are not what I would call character-driven. They have interesting characters in them, but they're not character-driven. They're more theme-driven and more story-driven. And when everyone likes to point to uh, Alfred Hitchcock in a bad way, as it, as it pertains to Brian De Palma oftentimes... Uh, I, I would point to uh, Hitchcock in the same way. Hitchcock movies were uh, often not character-driven. They were often theme-driven and often story-driven. The characters in his movies were not completely well-rounded. They did not have a tremendous arc as the story went along, uh, oftentimes. In fact, I would say most of the time, uh, his characters were fairly one, fairly one-dimensional. And again, there are exceptions in Hitchcock movies. But uh, just like the Palma, uh, the theme-driven, story-driven. Yeah, they're driven by ideas and and uh, how he can express those ideas visually. Yes, 
I, I, I think that's what turns De Palma on about mm-hmm. any piece of material. Uh, but the, the thing about the performances, too, is that, like we were discussing with John in an earlier episode, De Palma, you know, for from the benefit of time, he is able to expand upon Hitchcock's ideas and see how far he can go with it. And who knows, in, in future generations, someone might take De Palma's ideas and go farther with them. But the fact that he's able to go farther uh, elicits some some pretty brave balls out performances <laughs> in his movies. I mean yeah. Piper Laurie, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah, and you can go uh, John Lithgow. Uh, and he yeah. he gets crazy he's a, he gets crazier every movie he did with the He's ball. missing his presence is missing in Dress to Kill. Yeah. And you just you were just you know, with all that we know about John Lithgow and this guy I'll never forget when I found out John Lithgow made records for children, I was like, You've got to be kidding me. Um, well, you and you could picture him doing that role in Dress to Kill. I mean, he yeah, he did it he did it in a he did it in a certain way in Raising Cain. That's what makes uh, that he's so great, Raising Cain. It is like like John Lithgow's like greatest hits almost. I mean, it's all about him. You know, Sean Connery. Guys, uh, Sean Connery wanted to play that role, Michael Caine role, but he couldn't uh, get out of a commitment to do it. I think. Media. Oh, that would have been so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You guys were talking about uh, the the performances in. Uh, the Palma movies, and someone said something about how, uh, you know, oftentimes he'll get great actors, but he never gets great performances. And I don't think I don't think that's exactly how it was worded, but it was something to that effect. I don't uh, know. I it was the best actors do his movies, uh, but they they never give their best performances. I yeah, agree and with there's that something kind. there's maybe something to that. I don't know if anyone's ever given their best performance in a Brian De Palma movie, but you, I, it's interesting because you were also talking about how. His movies are operatic, and I agree. Mm-hmm. I couldn't agree more with that. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't see how anyone could disagree with that, and that's one of the things I love about it. And the thing about the actors working in that kind of movie, I think the actors that do well in a Brian De Palma movie are the actors who are able to be operatic. Mm-hmm. We're talking about guys, guys like John Lithgow, someone who can be very yeah. big and very large, or somebody like Al Pacino in Scarface or Carlito's Way. Right. Uh, even Nicolas Cage in Snake Eyes, able to be very big, very large, broad moves, very operatic, and he comes off very well in those movies. Even somebody, if you think about it, somebody like Tom Cruise, who's a little bit of an overactor sometimes and a little bit operatic sometimes when he shouldn't be, but in Mission right. Impossible... I would argue that's one of his best performances because in, it, it's appropriate in, a, in, in the way that a Brian De Palma movie is made. Right. And on, on the opposite side of that coin, that might explain why some of the some actors like Aaron Eckhart and uh, uh, you know Josh Hartnett sort of blend into the scenery in a movie like Black Dahlia. These are not big operatic type of actors. They're very sort of subtle, introverted kind of actors. I would say the right. same thing about Kevin Costner and The Untouchables, except he's like that in every movie. So. <laughs> But what about let's take um, Cliff Robertson in Obsession? I would have to say that's probably one of his best performances. I would have to say Travolta in Blowout is I would have to say his one of his greatest performances. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. I think so too about that. Mm-hmm. And, and and you know, and the, like we mentioned last night, the performances in Carrie. I mean, yeah. these are these are great performances, but their their intentions are different from what people look at as Academy worthy. Yeah. Right. Whatever, whatever right. that well, is. Performance. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. If you're going on that basis, yeah, I understand that perfectly. Then. Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to be working on that De Palma canvas, you've got to use big, bright colors. You've got to be yeah. able to bring it, or else you'll get lost. You know. And about. Uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, Jerry. Go ahead. No, no, go, go, go ahead. Go, go, go. Well, I was watching Inglorious Bastards again tonight with a friend. And we both love the movie. With with Rick, I was watching it, and he and there's there's a moment. Uh, at the theater at the end, and they, they cuts to the the first shots of the theater, and it points to one of the one of the higher ups in the Nazi party, mm-hmm. and there's actually a, a, a name title and an arrow pointing to him, yeah. like this little wacky kind of touch. Right. Mm-hmm. And and Rick said it's a, it's amazing how he can do something like that, and, and it doesn't take you out of the movie. Not at all. This is what uh, this is the secret I think, and this is where the split screen works so well in Carrie because it's all about establishing a tone where anything is possible. Yeah. The Palmas graded that, Tarantino's graded that. Right. So once you establish that tone, you'll pretty much accept anything because you understand that this is a ride and you're you're along for it. You know. Yeah. 
On the contrary, you guys were talking last night about how some people some people feel like the uh, split screen takes you out of the movie. I, I, I feel the exact opposite. Yeah. I feel like it puts you more in the movie. It gives yeah. you more to work with. It makes mm-hmm. your brain work harder to follow everything that's going on. And I, for me, it has the exact opposite effect. I would make the same argument for that scene in, in Glorious Fashions you were just talking about. Otherwise, you're just looking at a room full of Nazis. Uh, he gives you a little bit of information to work with, uh, as well as the visuals. It makes your brain work harder. It makes you more involved, more more uh, into this movie as it's happening. You're, you're, yeah. you're an active participant. But the well, Palma, the master of that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interactive. You know, everyone talks about interactive media. Well, these guys make sure that you you're watching the movie, and the movie's not watching you. Um, right. And the Palma was doing that thirty years ago. Yeah. I mean, that's very important with the Palma because we have a. You know, not to not to sound like a stuffy film critic, um, you have a very lazy movie going audience. No, a very lazy media related audience that wants everything spelled out in some way or doesn't really care. But these guys are like, no, I'm going to play some tricks. I want you to pay attention to what I'm doing, and yeah. and they do yeah. it very well on um, both of them. And it's so it's play fun. it's playful too. Yeah, it's not, you know? it's not like forcing you, but it, it's those are good points to bring out, good tricks of both of these directors to. To bring up, but I want to go back to something that Chris said about um, Josh Hartnett and Aaron Eckhart, um, especially Josh Hartnett. It was the first time that in a movie that, to me at least, that Josh Hartnett had a pulse, even, um, <laughs> even since the Virgin Suicides. Really, um, that was really the first time I felt he really came out. He was really unbelievably good in the movie, regardless of what people may say about the movie. I thought his performance was really one of the standouts. But he is playing a type. Yeah, I is. mean, I, if, yeah. if if this is if Black Dahlia harkens back to film noir in in some way, those, those characters represent t- types, the types that you saw in those kinds of movies, mm-hmm. right? You know, yeah. It isn't necessarily about uh, depth and creating a back char- backstory no, no, for your but character it, and letting that shine through. <laughs> and, you know. Uh, let's let's listen to this first interview with John, get his thoughts on Dress to Kill, and then uh, come back on the other side and, and see if we have any more insights after that. John Kenneth Muir is back with us tonight, as he is every night of the series this week. You can uh, read all about his books at johnkennethmuir.com and his film criticism, which is awesome, spectacular writing, at reflectionsonfilmandtelevision.blogspot.com. Here's what John had to say about Dress to Kill. Dress to Kill is interesting. And I think this is maybe another reason why people are are hesitant to, to really explore his films and, and find their true value. Because he also deals with themes that, in a way that make people uncomfortable. I mean, Dress to Kill, if anything, it's an exploration of sexual identity, yeah. I, I, yeah. I think. And actually, it opens similar to... Uh, Carrie, in a way. Uh, right. you, now you have a much older woman that having an erotic moment in the shower. <laughs> right? Like, yeah, with the yeah. steam and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. No, Dress to Kill is my absolute favorite um, De Palma film. If I had to put one De Palma film in a time capsule and you know open it 25 years later and say, everybody, this is what movies should be, that would be the one. Um, hmm. I, I mean, I, I think it's just staggeringly inventive, and, and I know people like to say it, it, you know, it's a ripoff of Psycho. But again, it goes back to, you know, he, he uses, you know, some sentences from Psycho to craft his own paragraph here and write his own, you know, unique composition. And and it is very much about about sexuality and and, and about um, about these things about sexuality that we don't really talk about. I don't want to say they're unsavory per se, but they're just they're not comfortable. We, you know, yeah. they're showing us things. And it's just this wonderful misdirection. I mean, the scene with Angie Dickinson where she's left behind her wedding ring, you know, it, it's the, it, you know, it's this wonderful misdirection because we're not thinking about who's waiting for her in the elevator. You know what I mean? And then, and then that attack comes from left field because we're thinking, oh my gosh, where's she going to tell her husband? And you know, she finds the letter. The guy has VD. Oh my gosh! And you think, oh, she slept in. I'm sure they didn't use protection. You know, it's like, you know, your mind is going in all these areas that like mean actually nothing to the movie, but they're dealing with this very uncomfortable terrain of sexuality. But but De Palma is doing it so he can hit you with that surprise, with the, you know, the killer in, in the elevator. And, you know, Hitchcock did it as well, but he did it in a lot less incendiary fashion. You know, he crafted, you know, this very elaborate story that took a lot of time about, well, I'm, of course, from Robert Block, but that, that you know, it, uh, Marion Crane 
uh, wants to be with this guy, so she takes her boss's money, and she's driving along, and she thinks someone's going to catch her. And, you know, the, the, mis- the misdirection there is, like, actually half the movie, in a way. Mm. You know, it's because we're thinking, well, what's going to happen to the money? Is Norman Bates going to get the money and leave his mom? First time we watch Psycho, you know, will he get to be free? Will he benefit from her crime? You know, will her life have some meaning? You know, we're seeing all those things. But it took it took Hitchcock, like, a half a movie to get us into all that. You know, De Palma, you know, through this, you know, just one razor-sharp uh, post-sex uh, scene, you know, this uh, mm-hmm. after-sex scene, you know, and, and, and those moments is dealing with such, you know, uh, closely held, uh, you know, personal ideas about, you know, fidelity and sex and, uh, you know, marriage. Also, he's able to, to have the same effect that Hitchcock did, but it doesn't take him half a movie. It takes him three minutes. Yeah. Um, you know? And that, it, 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 that sequence is amazing. The, the, the starting... I mean, st- not a word of dialogue, really, st- starting from the museum scene up to the, the right. elevator scene. And you, from just a purely visual standpoint, you are so empathetic every step of the way. All that ro- the roller coaster of emotion that Angie mm-hmm. Dickinson goes through, yeah. you're with her. It, but it's interesting because, <clears throat> and maybe this is an, another one of the, the people that cry misogyny against these films, what do you think of the equation of, of, of sex equals death? Because you often hear that applied to the Friday the 13th films as well. What do you think well, that application means with films like Dress to Kill? Well, you know, I, I, I think it's it's two different things in all honesty. And I don't say this to demean the Friday the 13th films at all. I like them very much. They're representatives of a form, the slasher form. Mm-hmm. And there are, there's a paradigm for that form. And in that form... Vice precedes slice and dice, and 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 what you want to get to is those set pieces where the characters are punished for the vice, where the kill. So so you, you know you can have them smoking weed, you can have them having premarital sex, and a couple movies they they snort coke, whatever. But it, it's like it's not really about sex there. It, it's it's about a draconian sense. Uh, a, a punishment for acting outside the laws of nature, which again we see embodied by Mother Nature's storms and those. So, I mean, it, 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 it's like a very regimented formula, but it doesn't really get to what are the human qualities of sex. And I mean, that that may be, and again, this this may be a prejudiced remark, but it might be because generally those are teenagers and they're pretty vapid teenagers. And it's like, hey, let's take off our clothes and screw, you know? Not that there's yeah. anything wrong with that, but there's not a whole lot of depth to those people. You don't go to a Friday the 13th movie to see. Uh, um, a meditation on sexuality, but Brian De Palma is different. When you know, I, I mean, I think you can say, yeah, there is the sex death thing in De Palma, but but it's a whole lot more nuanced than that. You know, it, it, it it's specifically about sex. It's it's about the lies uh, that people live with. It, it, it's about the discomfort that people live with around sex. It's about mm-hmm. how how much people want sex. Uh, and to feel sexual, you know, it's about all those qualities. I mean, it's so funny. There's even the scene where, you know, Angie Dickinson comes in and talks to her son, Keith Gordon, his name is Peter, and she says, what's your machine called? It's called a Peter. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it, it's sex on the brain. It's sex on Keith, the brain. Keith Gordon actually mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it, 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 you know, it couldn't be more clear that this is a meditation on sex and the things that sex leads us to. And, I, you know, I don't think De Palma is saying, you know, if you have illicit sex, you will die. I think he's saying that sex can lead us down some pretty strange alleys, the pursuit of sex, you know, and that maybe we, where where sex is involved, that we, 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 you know, we're so, you know, we we want it so badly that sometimes we have tunnel vision, you know, we'll we'll follow, you know, this person we want to have sex with through a museum, but we won't notice the big blonde behind us, <laughs> you know what I'm right. saying? It's a, right. You know, that, that you know, our, our, our eyes... Our, our eyes are in the wrong place. Again, it's about seeing. You know, what do we see? What do we perceive? And, and he makes us see those things too. He, he makes us get caught up in the, you know, the sort of illicit thrill of her her afternoon at the museum. Uh, you know, and yet he still shows us the the Bobby person. You know, Dr. Elliot's uh, uh, alter ego in those scenes. But somehow, and, and this is what's really amazing about this. Some, somehow, I mean, we know they're there, and we know there's something wrong. But that's not what we're thinking about. We're still thinking about the sex. They get to the taxi cab. Yeah. Sex, you know. <laughs> And, right. and you know, you know, it's just it, so. So it's very different from the Friday the Thirteenth movies, I think. Um, I, I, I think you know we're there. It's very formulaic, and that's okay. You know, it's, it's got a different, it's got a different purpose. Uh, you know, but here it's not. It, it, it's much more human and multidimensional in uh, De Palma's films. Do you see, since we've been talking about how De Palma's films relate to the time that they are made, 
how do you see that apply to, to just the kill? Well, I, you know, I think, um, you know, America was going through a major uh, realignment uh, in its political views, uh, you know, circa 1980. You know, the, the, the country went, uh, and, and this is very pertinent to blowout as well, mm -hmm. you know, the country went in a direction where instead of picking the guy who says, you know, that there's going to there's gonna be some hard truths here, you know, I'm going to put the solar panels on the White House and, you know, we're going to have to cut our oil because we shouldn't be dependent on oil. You know, we've had some problems. Instead of listening to the guy who said all those things and was really, you know, he was, he was right, but it wasn't good to listen to. You know, I was like, well, I don't want to hear that. Instead of listening to that guy, we listened to the guy, the cowboy who wrote in and said, we're great, America. You know, I'm going to rip those solar panels off the White House. And it made us feel good in the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't undercut that. It made us feel great. But we, it didn't really solve anything. And, and, and I think... You know, I know. You I mean De Palma is a leftist. He's an anti-establishment guy, and you, you know, if you look at what happened in the '80s, you know, it was very much a gulf between what was said was being done and what was really being done. And you know, you can debate the merits of each and every decision, and I, and I you know, I think people should do that. But if you, you know, Reagan ran on shrinking the federal government. He grew the federal government. He he ran on lowering taxes. He raised taxes. The most up to any point in American history up to that point. He ran, you know, very much as a traditional family values candidate. He's the nation's first and only divorced man for president, who was president. You know, and I'm not saying that it was wrong for him to be divorced. I'm just saying that there was a gulf between how people perceived him and what he actually yeah. was. And I think that you see a lot of that in the films of the 80s. Um, you know, this feeling that maybe we've been bamboozled into an illusion that, you know, our eyes weren't on the prize. We weren't seeing clearly. And, you know, if you look at blowouts specifically, that really comes to the fore because there are all these images of Americana, like the Liberty Bell and Old yeah. Glory. You know, all, all, you know, it's really there, you know. And, and, and all those things like fireworks and blowout are the front for uh, murder, for conspiracy, for cover-up, for people trying to ascend to positions of power. Now, I'd, I'd have to think about it in terms of dress to kill, except, you know, the only thing I would think about it would be sort of, and it would be very early for this message to come to come through, so I'm not, I'm not really sure it is there, but, you know, casting back on it, if you think, well, the idea here is sort of that we're, we're led on by this romantic idea, you know, sex with a stranger, you know, so mm -hmm. something that we want, but our eyes aren't really on the prize, we're not really paying attention to what the prize is, you, you, you could interpret that, perhaps, without reading too far, as being a message for the direction America was going. You know, our eyes weren't yeah. on the prize. Our ideas were on the rom romantic ideal. And you can even debate whether that was wrong or right. You know, we don't know what would have happened if we didn't have the romantic ideal. Maybe we would have sunk in completely into, um, you know, disillusionment and, you know, malaise, as uh, George Bush said. So, you know, history is what history is. I'm just yeah. saying that, you know, the, the path we took took us in a certain direction. And it's foolish to ignore that. Okay, that's John Kenneth Muir and his thoughts on Dress to Kill. And actually that line of thinking along the political landscape of the time, he it's really articulated uh, in relation to Blowout mm -hmm. tomorrow night, right. very very specifically. Yeah, I, I was, well, you know, I liked what he had to say, and it's very interesting. Everything that he just said, is easily relatable to today. Just today, yeah. if you read the news today, um, any newspaper, any website, um, it's the exact same thing. So it's really interesting that the, the we're still, as, as some directors said at the beginning of the um, Iraq War, hey, we're still going through the stuff we're going through with Vietnam here. We're being hoodwinked once again. Um, so I think that's, those are very important points to bring up. Um, but uh, but also the 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 illusion versus the reality and how you try to sell the illusion. Well, they and, and the and with blowout that's very explicit. Yeah. With dress to kill, it's like the how you know, how magnetic that illusion is and how much trouble you can get in <laughs> in the long run for exploring it. <laughs> no, but that's no, yes. it's, but that's important though. And the trouble is that I think the trouble is the thing that obviously hell even in something I don't think that works as well redacted. The trouble is the thing that's really attractive to De Palma, and he brings because he is one of the most anti-establishment directors out there. I mean, you can call a lot of people a sellout. You could never accuse Brian De Palma of being a sellout. That's just it, because we talk about '70s auteurs mm -hmm. and how many of them have kind of mellowed. 
a lot, a lot along the act of the line of actors, uh, mm-hmm. especially that that were really brave mm-hmm. and daring during that decade when they came to prominence. De Palma's never uh, backed down. He's he's never got lazy. I mean, his most controversial film was the last one he did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he's he's seventy years old on Saturday, and he has uh, the the same fire he did in the sixties. As the '60s kind of radi- radical, inspired by Hitchcock and Godard, right? Yeah, right. yeah. But, does, but still, yeah. his voice. But strangely, though, uh, he doesn't have the reputation of those same guys, of those Spielbergs and uh, you know, uh, Scorsese's uh, and those those same guys from the '70s. Even Coppola, who's had far more uh, bombs and duds than uh, Brian De Palma has. Is uh, con- it has a g- much greater name as far as as far as modern movie making goes. You know what I mean? Am I am yeah. I alone thinking no, that? No, well, he's, he's well. De Palma's working. I mean, De Palma's. First of all, this, the, the, we we talk about the strikes against De Palma, but pr- probably the main one is that he's working in a disreputable genre. The one the one that he's most known for. Right. 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 Well, well can I ask true. a question, Jamie? Can I ask you a question? What? Who says that? Who says that about the genre? What is it? Just is that a? Are the you, Academy? The Academy? You no. Know, okay. Well, I don't mean specifically the Academy, right. but the, he doesn't make the, thrillers and horror movies and these kind of sexual uh, uh, investigations are not the kind of movies that we consider to be important. And uh, you know, in, in in the film world, those are not usually the kind of movies that you see winning off. They're not the kind of movies that we we think of as you know. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, all right. I just want to understand where that, where the who, where we were, like the guy. I guess the guideline, the parameters, well, it, the word. That's all. I, I mean, obviously, we find importance in them. That's why we're doing shows on them. Yeah, but yeah, of course. There are all kinds of people on this planet, but I would subject to you that most people don't take horror movies seriously. I mean, yeah. there's group, there's groups of people that do. Mm-hmm. But most people look at thrillers and horror movies, and they just want to—they want to be scared. They want to be thrilled. Uh, they don't want to read anything into it for the most that's for the true. most part. You know, that's that's sad. That's not just true. That's true of um, you talk. To I would also, I would also yeah. argue that that stigma around uh, De Palma has a lot to do with the fact that, particularly in the last fifteen years or so, his movies haven't been particularly successful. Uh, and right. I would think that that. I, I, I think that has a lot to do with it. I think people give a lot more credit to something like The Lost World, even though it's not a particularly good movie. It, was, it made a shit ton of money. Yeah. And I, I, I do think that if uh, De Palma, I don't know what his most successful movie is. I would assume that it was probably Mission Impossible. Or The Untouchables. Uh, One of the, but really? it's, you're right, though, gross-wise, I think Mission Impossible. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I would think... I would think gross-wise, it would probably be Mission Impossible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I would I would I would guess that if he did another director for hire movie like that, you know, this year or next year, and it was a huge grosser, it made two hundred three hundred million dollars. I th- I would think that uh, that stigma around De Palma would be gone in a second with one blockbuster like that. I would I would I would venture uh, to say that it has more to do with financial success than anything always, else. Always, always does. I mean that's the lesson that we It could learned. be. Yeah. I mean, but he because he was considered. I mean, we still consider him this way, and the Palma fans all across the world, and there are many, many of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he was considered, you know, Scorsese, Coppola, the Palma. Yeah. They were the they were the seventies guys. You know, they they, they were the they were the new order. <clears throat> the yeah. Palma, I think, when he got his first taste of. You know, backlash and criticism for something like Dress to Kill, and then what I consider his best movie, Blowout, that didn't get any kind of recognition at the time of release, <clears throat> at least from audiences. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's he's got the sense of, all right, you 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 don't like this these elements of my movies. I'm going to give you these elements of my movies tenfold, and I'm going to yeah. make body dub body double. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I love Body Devil. God damn, I, I love Body Devil. I Devil. like that <laughs> too. I mean, he that's has... Craig Watson. What I was talking about earlier about operatic actors, mm-hmm. it goes for actors like Al Pacino and Nicolas Cage, who are great actors mm-hmm. who can be over the top and operatic. It also, and this is not a this is not a knock on De Palma. Mm-hmm. He uses actors over and over again who you might consider to be a little hammy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, yeah. People like that Craig Watson guy from Body <laughs> Devil. 
He's a right. little bit hammy. He's not the greatest actor in the world. He kind of overdoes it in the way that Tom Cruise does. But that works in a De Palma movie. Paint that works on that in that role too, because yeah, works yeah. very well. That that guy that guy is really out of his element. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that character. Yeah, um, and so you feel it from the actor too. That's a very you know it's a fun, I like Body Double a lot actually. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very fun movie, but it's a very biting satire on Hollywood. Yeah, he thinks of the ho- Hollywood at least, and I, and I think it's a, it's an important film and. Um, it's a great yeah. 80s film. It's just a great time capsule of the 80s, and especially oh, very De, Palma's, nice. De Palma's vantage point, especially. But, you know, we go back, you know, De Palma's one of these guys, regardless of what you think, you, the only other director I can think of like this, from a, who doesn't really make many movies anymore at all, who I think got burned out by the system and just burned out completely, was Alex Cox. He, he really could care less what you thought of his movies. He made this, he kept to his style, and that eventually grinded him into the ground. But here's De Palma. Yeah. He's he just doesn't he's like hey I'm gonna do this because this is how this is how I, I or you could say I was taught this is my life but shit I have so much to do and the guy in, in Muir says it perfectly he's the anti establishment this is a guy who's never been pro establishment Nate none of the films are none yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, as far as not making money goes. I personally, I don't give a shit. And uh, Muir yeah, thank made. You. Uh, I, I keep forgetting his first name. Is it John? John Muir. John. He made a yeah. great. He, he made a great point uh, the other night when he was talking about how a lot of times I'll see a De Palma movie and Snake Eyes is a perfect example, uh, of, uh, and you don't really care for it on the first viewing. Mm-hmm. I didn't really care for Snake Eyes on the first viewing, but there's mm-hmm. something about his movies, whether it's the style or the acting. But I think it's mostly. I think it's mostly De Palma more than anything else. Yeah. The way that they're made, they're inherently watchable. No matter if you like them the first time you see them or not, and all of a sudden you watch it the second time on cable probably, right. and a couple weeks later you're like, I should probably pick that up on DVD. I kind of right. like that movie. Mm-hmm. I know I didn't like it the first time I saw it, but there's something about that movie that I really like. Raising Cain works the same way with me. When I first saw it as a kid, my parents didn't like it. Uh, and I get, you know, kids are stupid, and I thought the so, same as my parents. I was like, oh, they don't like it, I don't like it. But mm-hmm. I watched it yeah. again, and I liked it. Same with Snake Eyes. Same thing happened with uh, Femme Fatale, which is probably maybe the most fun movie he's ever made. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a very enjoyable, sort of almost lighthearted movie, as De Palma movies go. Right. There's something about his movies that it, they grow on you like a, like a fucking wart. Like, yeah. just, like, <laughs> but you're right. You're right. And, and I, let me go. I mean, the, a movie I saw the first time I was not crazy about. It actually took me a couple of viewings. Um, Casualties of War was not the yeah. thing that came out immediately. But I think, actually, the is each Which is not the most fun movie he's ever made. No, no. But it <laughs> no. Is, I mean, it's, um, there's a lot. You know, we talk about, you know, we always talk about Hitchcock with him. But there's a certain element of, like, Sergio Leone in that film, the way it's set up and the way it's framed and everything. And it's a really superb movie. The more, you know, every time I go back to it, I see something new. I like, and it's just got, and, you know, Sean Penn's performance, I think, and Michael J. Fox, for that matter. Yeah. You know, very good performances from them. Um, and so, also, also, an, also, an, right, also right. another uh it it is i am deeply affected by casualties of war and that was around the time that you had this influx of vietnam films that was uh, the end. yeah that was towards the end of that same yeah. Wave. yeah and i think casualties of war got lost um and you know i had seen all those vietnam films around that time and and casualties of war struck me as different but i didn't realize how special it was until watching it again and again years later right and that's the great thing. I mean, De Palma repeat viewings of De Palma films uh, pay dividends. I, I mean, you, you get you get so much out of it with every viewing. You rediscover things and discover things for the first time. And uh, he's he's terrific uh, that way. Mm-hmm. That's the Scarface, which I've I've always said I loved. I, I've always loved Scarface, but it took me a few viewings to realize how funny it was. You know, it's very funny. It's hard not to laugh watching that now. And I can't, I, I, I can't really think of many filmmakers that you can go back uh, to their movies that you've seen many times before and have a different experience, you know, yeah. the fourth or fifth yeah. time watching it. So much so that uh, with De Palma throughout the years, it sort of seemed like, I think that's part of the stigma thing, too, is it seems like he's had a lot of flops through the years. It seems like it as we went through time. 
it seems like uh, that, uh, you know, Bonfire of the Vanities was a flop, or Casualties of War was a flop, or Raising Cain was a flop, or Snake Eyes was a flop. But the thing is, they were flops when they came out, but that doesn't make them bad movies. You go back and watch them. Uh, for having a lot of flops, if you look at his uh, his uh, uh, list of movies, mm-hmm. there's not a lot of bad movies in there. There might have been a lot of financial flops. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. But there are very few uh, movies which you could say were truly misfires. Uh, he really hasn't had very many. I would I would argue that Bonfire of the Vanities was uh, a misfire for was whatever reason. One true misfire that he had. Yeah. Uh, beyond that, I really in the last thirty years, I would argue that he really and perhaps uh, Black Dahlia. Uh, but again, I don't think that there's been enough time. Like, I just don't trust myself with giving that movie with saying that that movie's not great because it's a bomba movie, and I don't feel like yeah. I've seen it enough. It's a trashy, fun film. I, I'm sorry. I think it's a tr- it's a it's got all the trademarks that we've been talking about that we love. It's all there for you. Um, yeah. And and as we've as we've illustrated uh, time and time again as we talk every week about movies, mm-hmm. the fact that something's a financial flop doesn't mean it's not a not a great worthy film that'll stand the test of time and survive. Right. I mean, the Palmas right. films are prime examples of that. I think the only flop that he's made is Bonfire. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's made movies that aren't financially successful, but those movies didn't have a lot of risk attached to them in the first place. I mean, they, he, he doesn't make $100 million movies that completely fail. No. Yeah. yeah. No. He, he makes he makes a, a, a Raising Cane or something that will do you know, moderately well at the box office, and then it'll reap returns in the on the DVD market. And I, I don't think anyone loses their shirt. I mean, Scarface flopped when it – I think right. Scarface, Scarface yeah, did not, not do well. No, it was not financially successful. But it's made up for it. And then that's probably the most <laughs> the most talked about. I mean, that that one title is pro- probably accounts for the the most longevity out of any film he's ever done in his career. I mean, that movie has nine lives. Mm-hmm. Yes, it does. Yeah. The thing that uh, more than anything I love about the Palma, I think you know, a uh, director has to have something about him. He's got to have like one thing at least. Uh, that makes him unique, unlike any other uh, director. With uh, Spielberg, it's this sort of it's those sort of awe-inspiring moments. You mm-hmm. know, Spielberg is the master of that. Uh, with De Palma, I, I, and uh, once again, uh, John Muir touched on it a little bit uh, in that conversation. No one is better at set, and I would almost argue that even Hitchcock was not quite as good as, as De Palma at setting a trap for the audience. Uh, I don't think that anyone is better at it. And De Palma will set these very uh, large uh, and intricate and detailed traps for the audience. Dress to yeah. Kill is a perfect example mm-hmm. of what we were talking about at the beginning of the show. Uh, from the beginning of the movie, the trap is set. And you, as the audience member, are completely uh, misdirected and misguided in a thousand different directions. <laughs> you know that it's a murder movie. Uh, in 1980, people going to see it knew it was a murder movie because the trailer built it as such. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know it's a murder movie now because we've seen it, but I still get caught in that trap every time I watch it because you're so beautifully misdirected by the sexual nature of the beginning of that movie. And it's not just Dressed to Kill. It happens in every one of his movies. He sees. <laughs> He's the master of setting traps for you. Uh, yeah. Raising Cain has the has the fantastic trap at the end of the movie, the final, not the final scene, but the final showdown at the hotel at the end right. of the movie. And I know we're not talking about Raising Cane tonight, but I'm not going to be here for Friday, so I have to talk about it a little well, bit. Well, that's not, you go uh, for it. Did you hear uh, the interview? Did you listen to the interview I sent you? I did, I did, and it was fantastic okay. once again. Uh, but, uh, 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 you know, you, you, when you show up for that hotel, uh, he's telling you, okay, there is a trap being set here. I mean, the truck is backing out with the sundial in it. You can see that the thing's got three right. stories, elevators going up and down. Right. The baby carriage is coming in and out. He's like, okay. He's telling you, like, this is a trap. I'm setting it up for you. You have to figure out how it's going to play out. And sure enough, it plays out. And all It's like Mousetrap. It's like that Milton Bradley game Mousetrap. And all of the little pieces play their little role to set the trap for you. And how's it going to work out? Who's going to die? Who's going to get shot? Where's it going to fall? Uh, no one does that better than De Palma. I would argue that that uh, even 
even our gods, Martin Scorsese, Steven Spielberg, and James Cameron, are not as adept at making a trap for the audience like that. No one can do it like he can. Well, he's working in a purely – I mean, this is why he chose the thriller genre for, for, for the most part uh, throughout his career. I don't think it's a matter of him being stuck in the thriller genre, even though there was a time so when – uh, I, I, he he found a genre that allowed him to express uh, his full potential of, from from a visual standpoint. Uh, that works. That can work purely visually. Uh, I know there was a period in his career, and you know, and he's done many different types of movies as we've talked about on the show. And I think the first time he really felt that was Scarface when he said, you know, I, I this is a different kind of genre picture. It's a, I'm I'm going from a really good script from a different writer and a different set of producers, you know, Marty Bregman and uh, a whole different kind of company. Let me see how I can flex these muscles. And he's done that uh, since Scarface. He's, he's vacillated back and forth uh, more and more throughout his career between, you know, what we associate as uh, De Palma's prime genre, the thriller, yeah. to Carlito's Way and that, that kind of project. Yeah, well, not only Carlito's Way, but... Uh... A lot of people forget about Mission to Mars, and I know, Jamie, you're a big fan of Mission to Mars. I love Mission to Mars. You know what? That's another prime example. I watched that. It's a family movie that he injects his style into in a really, really underrated way no one ever talks about, but that's a family movie made by De Palma, and it feels like a De Palma movie. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And and, and hopeful. I mean, I was... just like Casualties of War and Carrie, it's a De Palma movie that that moves me uh, on on a real deep kind of emotional level, uh, and it, it's a movie that inspires awe in me. Um, and it's all De Palma the way he shoots it and the and the balletic nature, even the, the scene where, where Tim Robbins uh, kind of bites the dust. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When they have uh-huh. to let him when they have to let him go. Right. I mean. Yeah. That's that's so haunting and terrifying and strangely beautiful in a way. I, I almost hate to hate to say that because well, I, I might sound like beautiful. might sound like a freak. But no, but I know it's not. You, as you said when we talked about it originally a couple of years ago, it has one of the most hopeful sequences filmed in a De Palma film. The uh, Van Halen sequence, you yeah. know, the jump sequence is one of the most happiest moments in a De Palma film, you know. And that's, that's, that can probably be considered a, a flop, too. I mean, Disney, I'm sure they spent money, a lot of money on that. Well, we're talking about it now, ten years later, so, you know. Yeah, we we are. But what we were talking about how things were perceived by audiences at the time they were released, too, and how yeah, things changed now. Least... I don't sense that the majority has caught on, probably because we have shorter attention spans to younger audiences now, but I don't think that they've caught on to what's really special about Mission to Mars as much as they should have and the numbers that they should have. That's a movie that needs to be rediscovered. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's going to be the kind of movie that, and we've talked about this before, we feel sometimes like uh, all movies are dying and, you know, the whole thing about being a cinephile is dying and there's not going to be movie geeks, but there are. There will always be movie geeks. Just like, you know, we fell in love with movies and wanted to find every movie made by uh, Paul Schrader and, and Brian De Palma and John Milius and all those guys, and we wanted to watch every Scorsese movie, no matter what it was. There will be people uh, of the next generation that will oh, yeah. want to watch every De Palma movie from, you know, Mission to Mars will have been made uh, 10 years before they were born, but they're going to want to find it somewhere on the Internet mm-hmm. or on Netflix or something like that and rent it, and that'll be a jewel that they'll find about. And they will be saying to someone, hey, that Mission to Mars movie he made for Disney, actually a really good movie. Um yeah. It won't get lost. In fact, I don't uh, think I would any of these will get lost. Just I was just like going through iTunes earlier, and, and you know, all like as long as you have services like iTunes or Netflix or whatever the delivery system is, and they have these vast libraries, and they're going to keep getting more and more. That's a reason to be hopeful. I mean, right there, there's going to have people like us, yeah, who lots of people yeah. like us who are going to be, you know, at night. Looking around, hey, what can I watch? And you know what? They Mission to Mars or Snake Eyes might be one of those, or Casualties of War. You never know, and that's you've got to be optimistic for that reason alone. The discovery. Yeah. Well, you know, I I think that these movies all will live. I mean, these these movies that we've been discussing have lived for twenty, thirty years already. 
Uh, I just think that people need to take a look at Mission to Mars specifically mm-hmm. again. No, I agree Because I, I, I still, if people even know about it, I still sense a real dismissal of that, that movie. I, I, I think it needs to Beautiful be. Beautiful score. Beautiful. Yeah. Soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We, we need to get to our next interview. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's been a great conversation, though. Let's get to our next interview. George Leto, uh, the producer uh, of the Palma films, including... Obsession, uh, Dress to Kill, and Blowout. This is a great guy, and and just a, a, an incredible amount of information and, and fun in these interviews. He's going to be here tonight for Dress to Kill and tomorrow night for Blowout. Uh, he started out as a as an agent, and he kind of packaged, kind of corralled creative forces behind uh, some big movies early on in his career. So he's had a hand in movies like Mash and McCabe and Mrs. Miller and on and on and on. He's so accomplished. But as a producer, uh, his first uh, work as a producer was for Robert Altman on the film Thieves Like Us. That's a great way to start a career. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and he went on to produce the De Palma films. And he's still producing. And we talk about uh, his work with De Palma and also what he has in the pipeline upcoming. Here is George Lido talking about Dress to Kill. I was the agent who sold Sisters uh, to the distributors. Uh, they wanted to send me the profits on Carrie because he was making obsession with me before that. Mm-hmm. They were sure that I was his agent at that point before I produced Obsession. <laughs> you know? right, I was involved right. in you know, most, almost all of these pictures. So tell me how, how you first met uh, De Palma. That that really is a fascinating story because uh, it was purely by accident. I had never met him. I've read about him. I've never seen any of his pictures, but friends of mine admired him. So anyway, uh, Eddie Pressman used to come to my office because I had a distinguished list of writers like Waldo Salt and Ring Gardner Jr. And he was always trying to hire writers to develop a project. And one day he called me up and he said, uh, George, I have this picture by Brian De Palma. And I'm having difficulty getting a distribution deal for it. That's when I was an independent agent of my own agency, mm-hmm. George Lido Agency, right? And he says, could you help me with the distribution? I said, sure. He says, well, I'll come out and screen the picture. I said, don't. I'm going to be in New York tomorrow. And he said, oh, great. I said, set up a screening for me. So they set up a screening at Rich Soli. And I went into the room. There was nobody there except one guy who was arranging the film. I didn't know who he was. And, and he says, whenever you're ready, Mr. Lito, I said, fine, run the picture. And I ran the picture. And it was the sisters. Mm. You know? And, when the, and I really liked the picture. And I thought his cinema technique, I thought, was very special. Mm. And I turned around to the guy. I know who I was talking to. And I said, you know, I like the picture and I can sell it. But what I really like is the director. I think he's going to have a big future. Right, and it turned out that was Paul Hirsch, the editor, who later worked for me on Obsession. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so next thing I know, I'm back in my office, and and I don't remember exactly the chronology. I think I was already making a deal on Sisters for him with uh, AI American International at the time, and uh, and uh, and my secretary says to me, Brian De Palma's in the reception room. He'd like to see you. <laughs> so hmm. said, I said fine <laughs> so he came in and we talked I said Brian I'm happy to meet you I said I really love your picture I think you're a very talented man you got a great future so he said I'd like you to be my agent I said well I guess you didn't hear I made an announcement to all my clients that at the end of the year I was quitting as an agent they should all go get other agents <laughs> wow yeah <laughs> and he said I, so I said obviously you didn't know I said I'm quitting at the end of the year he said, well, I'd rather have you for a year. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay. And so along the way, I think I made a deal for him for uh, Phantom of Paradise. And I'm trying to remember what else was at the top of my head. But but in the course of that, uh, now he knew I was quitting to be a producer. He and Paul Schrader brought me a story. Mm-hmm. Just a, you know, like a 20-page treatment, you know. And yeah. it was called Deja Vu at the time. And uh, I read the story. I said, "Go, you guys are working me over." He said, "What are you talking about?" I said, "Come on, you know I'm of Italian origin, and I love Italy. And you bring me a thriller about Florence." I said, "My children and my nieces, my family went to school at Tulane, and you're bringing me a film about Florence, Italy. You know I can't say no." <laughs> <laughs> 
And I love to eat. What two better places? <laughs> anyway, to make the story short, I love the story, obviously. Mm-hmm. And uh, boy, nobody wanted to do it. Everyone was afraid of it because of the, you know, the subtext of the in- of the incest uh, element of the story. Right. And uh, <clears throat> so finally, I got very frustrated. I said, Brian, you really want to make this picture? He said, Yes. So I said, here's the plan. Nobody's going to get a lot of money, and I worked out the plan with him. And if we can get, you know, cast like we got, you know, you know Cliff and uh, Jean-Vierre Bouchot, I said, I'm going to borrow the money, and I got some friends that will give me whatever I put up. All right? They're going to match me. Okay? Mm-hmm. So I put up my house to the bank wow. to borrow like $500,000. And I got another five hundred thousand dollars from friends and credits and whatever. And we went ahead and made the picture like from me before. Mm. And uh, it was a frightening experience. We survived and made lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> Master filmmaker Brian De Palma now creates Obsession. Michael Cortland has denied a nightmare for sixteen years. Now that nightmare will have its revenge. What was she like? Elizabeth. She was very much like you. How did she die? I killed her. Cliff Robertson. Jean-Bierre Bougeau. I am Elizabeth. I came to give you a second chance. Love. An act of love in its ultimate state becomes the ultimate in suspense. Obsession. Well, we're in Florence making this picture because now I didn't have a completion bond. I mean, I'm really flying, you know, with my pants semi, you know, dropping, <laughs> drooping. <laughs> Right, uh, and yeah. uh, we're in Florence, and Brian's got I got Vilma Ziegler for him, who worked with Bob Altman, who was one of my clients, mm. you know, to work with Brian on this picture because we're going to be in Florence, New Orleans. We got that beautiful picture, so Vilma was a great cinematographer, and he agreed to do the picture because he wanted to go to Florence and New Orleans. So <laughs> 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 he loves to eat. <laughs> so anyway, we're in the Piazza Signoria, which is the famous square, and. Florence, where they had the original, when we were shooting a picture of Michelangelo's David, right? Mm-hmm. And we had the big brutes at the time, and we were doing Panavision, so, and Vilmos was really shooting a masterpiece, yeah. right? And Brian would, when, you know, the assistant director said to me, that, you know, I was having some espresso in the chilly night, he said, you know, Brian is already up to his 20th take, I said, I know. He said, Jesus, George, this is going to cost a fortune. I said, well, just hold on. I'm going to go have a talk with Brian. And Brian was always talking to me <clears throat> that he wanted Bernard Herman to do the score. Mm-hmm. And, and that would mean a symphony orchestra in London. And I said, Brian, you know I said yes to Bernard Herman. But if you don't hurry up, you're going to get two guitars. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and that straightened it out. <laughs> he didn't hurry up, but I didn't say anything. <laughs> Uh, tell me, I got a, a couple of questions about your work with De Palma. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me how, how you observe him working as a director, and and as on a friendship basis, how, how is he? What's he like? Well, Brian was always, uh, you know, I called him reserved, and I called him sometimes shy. Mm-hmm. Okay. Other people thought he was introverted or antisocial. <laughs> I could tell you stories about the Italian crew. Like he didn't say good morning to him. I said, "What, well, Brian? Say buongiorno." You know, it's a custom here. You know, I can tell you those kind of stories. But you know, I like the Italian stories. Italians, when it rained, they didn't want to shoot. And so he calls me up one day. He says, "If the crew stops shooting, I want the rain. Vilmos wants the rain, but they won't shoot." George, I'm in the office, right? I said, you want him to shoot, Brian? He said, sure. I said, here's how you do it. He said, they're all in the truck, you know. And we had raincoats in the truck in case it started to rain. Mm -hmm. Go over to the truck and say to the key grip, you say, per favore, out to me, out to me. (laughs) Please help me, please help me. (laughs) 
They'll understand that. They'll get out of the goddamn truck and start shooting. <laughs> he calls back. He says it's working. <laughs> oh, that's great. You know. So, uh, but you know, but 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 Brian was you know serious. I mean, he was when he was directing, he was totally absorbed and focused. Mm-hmm. Which is, uh, he was a very serious guy to work with. It was no nonsense. And. Uh, and, and I and I would say that uh, you know he was really good to work with because if we got behind or something I'd show up at the set at six in the morning I said Brian you know we're this so much behind you know the complete spine company all the nonsense I said what are we going to do today and he would say okay and he'd take me for a walk and he'd say we're going to take here we're going to like this and the camera's going to approach and she's going to walk out and we'll turn around the camera we'll follow her through the door. And then if she pauses, the camera's going to pan up. And he would walk me through every shot he was going to do that day. And 20 minutes later, I'd say, thank you very much. I'm leaving. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And then he'd do I, it. <laughs> yeah. And you know, so tell it, was me, good. it was very good to work with him. Tell me your take on the, the Hitchcock uh, comparison. Obviously, he is influenced by Hitchcock, as he is many other artists like Godard and so on and so forth. But yeah. how do you see that he... Um, he transcends that Hitchcock influence. Well, uh, I think um, transcending Hitchcock, that's a big question. Because first <laughs> of all, <laughs> uh, Brian was an enormous admirer of Hitchcock, and so was I. And I love suspense thriller pictures. It's a genre that you know I just love. And, mm-hmm. and one of my attractions to Brian was he loved that genre. And, 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 and Brian did master pretty much the techniques that Hitchcock used. And, and how did he do it differently? I, I mean, uh, it's hard to say. I mean, we had, uh, Panavision. We had, uh, you know, a great cameraman. He, Brian got more absorbed in detail. I mean, I think uh, he brought things that were part of his life, his love of art. His brother's a famous artist, uh, you know, painter and, I don't know. I don't know how to explain that he transcended Hitchcock, except that he became the contemporary, you know, filmmaker who, you know, who paid uh, homage to Hitchcock, but yeah. but still obsession in the stories and, you know, the stories it chose. The obsession uh, was uh, was it was very much a Hitchcock picture and uh, a kind of genre and story. But uh, I think uh, the way he utilized the environment of the picture and the locations and everything, and I think that was more than Hitchcock generally did. Uh, uh, and I think, uh, you know, the, uh, well, Bernard Herrmann was used by Hitchcock all the time, so that's certainly, you know, paying respect to, paying respect to Hitchcock. Uh, uh, but stories like Blowout, for example, you know, we're really about you know, contemporary American life and the problems of the society is the yeah. is the undertone of the story, you know. Uh, so it's um, and that's Hitchcock didn't go too much into uh, the social aspects of his of his thrillers, uh, although he did do some political thrillers, you know. So uh, you know, right. I, I I think you'd have to say he was a disciple of Hitchcock's, and and he learned very well how to make very good pictures. I mean, that's and, the best I could say. And when, and when Dress to, to Move to Dress to Kill, real quick, when that uh, project came about, uh, what were your initial thoughts thoughts on that film? Well, I remember it like it was yesterday because I used to take my family to Italy for summer holidays. Mm-hmm. And, you know, after three or four weeks of playing tennis, I get restless. So I said to my wife, I'm going back to L.A. I had some stuff to take care of. And it was very expensive that summer. And I just had a film that later was called the great, greatest teenage film ever made that, that lost money called, called Over the Edge that I produced. Mm-hmm. You know? So I said, I said to myself, I better get back to LA to make some money. And I'm sitting my, off my secretary said, Brian, the palm is calling you. I said, oh great. You know? And he said, George, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta talk to you. I said, yeah, I'm here. Talk to me. He says, I got a script. You gotta read. I said, send me the script. He said, "Well, I'm down the street at the Beverly at the Hilt, at the uh, Beverly Wilshire Hotel. Can I bring it to you?" I said, "Of course." <laughs> and I'm saying, "I said, geez, I hope I like it. I need a deal now." <laughs> <laughs> I 
So he brings in the script and he says, how soon can you? And I said, great, Brian. Over he's got to read this, George. I said, how soon will you read it? He said, I said, well, I said, uh, you go have lunch. And when you finish, you come back. I will have read the script. He said, really? I said, absolutely. Hmm. So he comes back. I read the script. It was called Dress to Kill. I said, Brian, I love it. It's great. If we don't agree on a deal for me to produce this picture, I'm going to kill you. Mm. <laughs> you you believed in it. I loved it, and yeah. and I think in, in the the sequence, you know, and I said to boy, the sequence in the museum with no dialogue and everything, you know, I loved reading it. I I, I think it's going to be very difficult to pull off. He says I'm going to pull it off. I says hey, I'm you know I'm with you. I hope so. You know, I yeah. said because it could be a great sequence. And in my opinion, what he did and the music of Pino Donaggio. Mm. And, and you know, uh, I think uh, uh, I think it's I think his uh, it's about to, I think it's about eight minutes of film is among the best eight minutes of film I ever saw in the museum scene. I agree with you, and yeah. we've talked we've talked about this scene in the in the previous interviews that I've done for this series, and you can read the the roller coaster of emotions uh, on on her face throughout that eight-minute sequence, and not a word of dialogue has to be spoken. And, and the camera is so expressive in all of his films, but that sequence in particular really But the music out. he and Pino agreed on to underscore that sequence is also mm-hmm. magnificent. It's part of the whole, the whole, you know, the whole chemistry of what makes that thing so fantastic because it's the essence of what can be done with sight and sound but no dialogue, music. Right, right. You know, and to me it was extraordinary and... And I'm a trained musician, which was from my youth, you know. And mm. so I really thought it was like he did. He did a cinematic ballet here. It was fantastic. Did it seem like daring uh, material when you were doing it? Oh, yeah. I mean, come on. I mean, 
You know, I said, Brian, we just did a movie about with an underlying theme of uh, incest. Now we're doing an underlying theme of about sex changes. <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, I you know, I wonder what they're going to write about us. <laughs> But, you know, that was, you know, when you say where was he different than Hitchcock, you know, Hitchcock had those proclivities in a certain way, and Brian, you know, took them the next step. I think that's that's the question you were asking me earlier that I couldn't answer earlier, but you may be aware of it now with this this discussion. Yeah. I think that's where he went a step further. Tell tell me you... Tell me you... How much of a presence you are on, on the actual sets for these films. Well, the way I always like to work is I love to work, and the way I work with Brian, we worked on the script. Mm-hmm. And we worked on the overall production plan. But once the camera turned on, unless there was some real problem, you know, he's running the show. It's right. his show. And, and you know, there were some problems sometimes in, in doing Dress to Kill, for example, in New York. We, we didn't have a museum when we started. We were sure we'd get some museum. But we couldn't get the Met, we couldn't get the Modern Museum, and we couldn't get any decent museum for that sequence. Mm. You know, so, uh, so I asked the production manager to call up LA, you know, to Sam Markov, who's really a terrific guy, but, you know, he always liked to hold on to the buck. That's how he survived in the business. Mm. You know, and I said, well, Brian and I want to go to New York to shoot the Philadelphia Museum. You know, and the production manager said to me, he said, they won't okay it. I said, make the plan and go ahead anyway. He said, George, are you crazy? I said, go ahead and do it. But I had a great relationship with Sam. We did a lot of business, and we were very friendly. You know, so he calls me. I said, George, you can't go there. I said, Jesus, Sam, you know, the production guy didn't tell me. The truck's already left. (laughs) (laughs) That's great producing right there. (laughs) And then when we got to the museum in Philadelphia, guess what happened? You know, after about three or four or five days, whatever it was, I don't remember the exact schedule, the museum wanted us out, mm-hmm. right? I remember the morning I came, instead of coming to set, we I usually do six, seven in the morning, I came eight, nine o'clock, and uh, uh, Brian said to me, uh, and I saw them pulling cable. I said, Brian, why are they pulling cable? He said, didn't Freddie tell you we have to leave? And Freddie was a production manager, you know, Fred Caruso. Mm-hmm. I said, no, he didn't tell me. He said, well, he said, we're going to leave. I don't know what we're going to do. I said, what you're going to do is keep shooting, okay? And I'll talk to Freddie. But don't think, don't even pay attention to it. Just keep shooting. Okay, and I went to Freddie, and I said, Freddie, what's this about? He said, the, the, the museum asked us to leave. So just because they asked you to leave, Freddie, why are you leaving? He said, because they asked us. I said, Freddie, stop pulling cable. And if there's anything they want to know or do or say, tell them to call me. And I'm from Philadelphia. Brian was from Philadelphia. Uh-huh. Without, you know, I, the congressman was a friend of mine. I knew the mayor when he, I was a little kid. <laughs> mayor, so yeah. I called everybody. I shook every tree to make the story short. And uh, we stayed in the museum. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, the the response to the film. Well, first of all, it, it, didn't it uh, didn't it have difficulty going through the MPAA at first? Oh, oh they drove us a little crazy. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I remember. <that. laughs> I mean, I I gotta tell you, Brian was very good at, for a guy that doesn't like to talk a lot. Brian was very articulate and very effective in talking to the head of the MPA about the, all the different shots and scenes they wanted and. Uh-huh. You know, and uh, and, and I got to do well. You know, I I I did as little as much as I could because it was it was very difficult there. But without Brian handling handling the guy and doing what he did, we never would have got through it. He, Brian did a great job because Brian again was going the next step. You know, I mean yeah. the body double behind the shower glass that was supposed to be you know, uh, what's her name? Um, Angie Dickinson. Angie Dickinson. Uh, you know, the way, and, you know, and all the things he did, I mean, you know what they are. You know, it's the first time pubic hair was shown. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Everything that seemed so tame today, it was very naughty then. <laughs> yeah, it, it, was a, it was a shocking moment. And also, 
I think when when audiences of today go back and watch that film, it's it's kind of refreshing that uh, it, it, it concerns a an older woman, uh, her, her kind of blooming sexuality. Yeah, was it a teenager? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the great line for me with Angie was that while he was shooting the scene, and you know, when he, when he's shooting Angie, the, he was she was the camera was be in, in front of the glass, so she was behind the steamed up glass, you know, in the, in the nude scene. So you would just see the outline of her and her face a little bit, depending where the yeah. scene was, you know. And then she would come out with a robe on and was leaving the set, and, and I saw her leave. I was watching the shooting that day, and. And about a half hour, an hour later, she comes down, you know, changed and everything. And I said, what are you doing here, And she goes, just kidding here. And she says, I came to see who's playing my body. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So tell me how it was received by audiences, Dress to Kill. Well, um... I mean, uh, the movie was a was a big hit. I mean, it, it, it did very very well, and and you know, and I think that it, it, I, I mean, I think they loved it because they kept coming, and it was very successful. And, mm-hmm. and uh, but you know, like I get you know, like I can only give you <clears throat> my personal reaction mm-hmm. is that when that elevator sequence happened, even yeah. though I produced the film, I went through all this in the script. You know, I saw all the rushes, the ending. I, every time it would come up, I couldn't look at the screen. <laughs> and for months, I'd get on an elevator. I'd get a little apprehensive. And lots of people told me the same thing. I saw your movie, and I can't get on an elevator anymore. <laughs> it did for elevators what Jaws did for the water, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so it had a shocking effect, but, you know, it was a terrific movie, a great movie. Oh, it's brilliant. Okay, that is Mr. George Alito, producer of Dress to Kill and Blowout. He'll be back tomorrow night. You know, uh, talking to him and, and listening back to him, there are some really warm and generous and terrific people behind the art form that we love, and he's definitely one of them. You oh, can yeah, sense without it. a doubt. He, he seems like quite a character. I love that. I mean, really charismatic, yeah. like, just a lot of great stories. I mean, that was wonderful. He's, you know, another favorite part of mine of the museum sequence is when the camera pans outside of the museum, and it pans from Angie Dickinson across to the taxi cab. Yeah. And there, and in that pan, right in the forefront, is the killer. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, it, it's not subtle at all. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. <laughs> uh, I love, I love that moment. Uh, okay, Jerry, I'll give you the choice. Wh- which, which interview do we want to go with next? Uh, Keith Gordon or Nancy Allen? Oh, um, God, that's a tough call. Well, I, I, I haven't heard the Keith Gordon one yet. Can we, <laughs> can we hear that? Okay. Keith Gordon, this is a great interview. This is, a, this is an hour long interview, only half of which is airing tonight concerning De Palma and his experiences on Dress to Kill. The other half we will air <clears throat> later in the month, uh, and that concerns Keith Gordon's directing career, which is really an astounding one. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. Without As an actor. Doubt. Yeah, yeah. As an actor, and I, I bragged and bragged and bragged on him about Waking the Dead, which is my favorite movie that he's done. As a director, uh, as an actor, uh, you remember him from Jaws two. That was his first movie. He was also in De Palma's home movies mm-hmm. that we've discussed in a prior show. Christine, uh, Back to School. I mean, these are these are like monumental movies for monumental uh, movies of the eighties, without a doubt. And for us, you know, when we were growing up, you know. Uh, and as a director, uh, he's, he's turned in great work, like A Midnight Clear and Mother Night, Waking, uh, the, Dead. Waking the Dead, Singing Detective. The Singing Detective is a very underrated movie. I mean, it's, the source material is hard to beat, but I got I, I thought that was a pretty cool movie. I mean, he's a, he's a fascinating director. This is another guy who paid attention to everyone he worked with on yeah. the set. He paid attention to all these guys. And I can see his relationship with the Palma mm-hmm. paying off in... Uh, something that he's worked on continuously as a director of Dexter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's, dire- he's directed a lot of Dexter. Well, especially also the ones last season with John Lithgow. I mean, yeah. I yeah. Mean, come on. I mean, it's all there. I mean, it's awesome. Yeah. Well, you'll hear all about his directing work uh, later on in the month when we air that portion of the interview. But for now, 
We're going to hear about his beginnings with De Palma and his Dress to Kill experience in particular. Here is Keith Gordon. You always had your eyes set on directing, uh, even before you got into the acting business, I understand. I did. I was one of those little film nerds in my teens. I ran around with a... Back in the old days, we had we had two great cameras. They did not like the video that the kids have now. And I ran around with this little Bauer Super 8 camera making really bad movies with my friends and, and trying to get sound to sync up without ever fully understanding the principles of why it would never quite work no matter how many times I edited it on my tape recorder and not realizing that without crystal sync it would never work. But uh, so there, I would cover my room with little snatches of tape and all that. But I, I love making movies. And I love going to movies. I was a big you know movie nerd. I would just go to films all the time, and I worked in the Museum of Modern Art and the film archives after school, um, you know, as an intern, and um, and I, I love films, and, and then I lucked into the acting thing, and, and I started working as an actor, which was wonderful and, and, and exciting and fun, but I always dreamed of getting back to making films, and, and really working with Brian was an amazing education, because Brian was a teacher. The first film we did together was a little comedy called Home Movies, and that was literally done as a film class, he was teaching at Sarah Lawrence College, and he decided the best way to teach people how to make a little independent film was to make one. And through a odd series of events, I ended up casting the lead. Um, but he sort of let me be a little bit like a student in the class. I mean, he let me join in the endless asking of questions and hanging out in the editing room and looking at all the dailies and talking about why he was doing things a certain way and why he wasn't. So. It was sort of an amazing master class in filmmaking while I was getting to get paid to be an actor. Uh, and that continued to a certain extent on Dress to Kill. Um, you know, it certainly wasn't, that certainly wasn't a classroom project, but, but Brian by that point was already very kind with me and knew about my excitement about the idea of directing one day and, you know, just would let me look through the camera or ask why he was doing things or just, you know, hang around on days I wasn't shooting and bug him with questions. And he was very, sweet and, and, and patient with me because he could have easily said, will you go away and leave me alone? And he, he never really did. Um, well, so. when you when you first uh, were approached about home movies, and I, I, I don't know, I think it was made a couple of years before it actually got a release, if I'm not mistaken. So had you yeah, already done was. Jaws? You'd already done Jaws 2 and all that jazz at that time? Uh, I, I, yeah, I'd already done, actually I think the order, and, and again, getting old, my memories are fading, but um, Jaws 2 was definitely the first feature I did, and then I think, um, yeah, I did home movies and then all that jazz, they were, they were filmed right around the same time as each other, and I was also doing theater in New York at the same time, and the story behind the casting on home movies, which, you know, is kind of off the dress to kill subject, but it was sort of a weird story, was, I was called by my agents who uh, called me and said, um, there's a student film that Brian, Brian De Palma is going to be sort of supervising. Do you want to read for it? And I thought, I don't know if I want to do a student film. I mean, I'm starting to work on, you know, off-Broadway and doing more. I don't, know if, I don't know if that's the best thing for my career. And then they said, well, you know, it's, it is just right on the same block where you live that they happen to be auditioning people. And I thought, well, if it's on the same block, why not go there? So I, I did. And that night I got a call from Brian saying, well, I'd like to have you come down and read for me. And it was only then that I realized that he was actually going to direct the movie. But I came about an inch from not going in, which who knows where I'd be today. I mean, I, you know, I could be working in McDonald's very easily. And, and <laughs> that, that but, weird but, coincidence that happened to me on my block was it led to it all happening. But you, uh, being a movie geek like, like we are, yeah, absolutely. Uh, d what was your consciousness of, of De Palma's work prior to meeting him that first time? As a film nerd, I was, you know, very aware of Brian's work, and I, I had seen certainly all of his major films, and I'd seen things like Greetings and Hi Mom, because I was a guy that would go to all the revival houses and see, you know, mm -hmm. films that weren't high profile. I don't think I'd seen Get to Know Your Rabbit till after I'd worked with him, and I hadn't seen The Wedding Party, because um, those are things you really had to seek out, and you know. Um, but I'd seen all the major films and Carrie and. Obsession and the Fury and and, I, and a number of them I'd seen more than once because I find with films and I still do this today. I mean now you know thirty years later you know I still find it's the same thing. The first time I see a movie, I, I just want to get lost in the story. I don't want to sit there and think about how did they do it or you know why did the director make the choices they made. Then if I'm interested in the filmmaking. I'll go back a second or third time, as I often do with Brian, and then sit there and think about, oh, look at how he shot that scene and look at the lighting. And, but, but the first time through, I don't want to even have that in my mind. I just want to get lost in it. And I, uh, you know, I, I just had that experience with 
Chris Nolan's film Inception, where I went and, you know, I didn't sit there thinking about, how did they do this special effect? I just was, like, enjoying the movie, and now I know I'm going to have to go back and see it a second and third time and sit there much more analytically looking at, okay, what did he do and how did he do it? Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly, you know, with Brian's films, I, I did a bunch of that because he was such a, a, a terrific technician. Um, but the first time through, I just wanted to get lost in, in watching the movie. Let me ask you about his style of working as you observed it, starting with the camera, it, it, which, you know, you can't have a discussion about the Palma without discussing the montage uh, and the sequences and, and just his enormously inventive camera work. When, As an actor, can you feel a special energy from that, that camera work? It's interesting. I mean, I'd love to say yes, of course you do, but I don't know that you do as an actor. As an actor, you're so busy being nervous about what you're doing. I mean, acting is by nature an incredibly narcissistic process, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean, uh, having been an actor, I mean, but you are, it's, it's very, you're very into what you're going through emotionally in the moment and what's going on with you and the other actor in the scene and, and, and I think most actors don't even spend a lot of time or energy thinking about what the camera's doing in a conscious way. I mean, you'll see real veterans get used to, they'll ask what a lens is or whatever, where the camera's going to be, because they'll use that as part of how they, they do their own body language or how big right. or small the performance is. But, you know, as an actor, you don't think about it. Now, as somebody who's interested in filmmaking, if anything, it was very attention-splitting for me, because I always, always wanted to be watching what Brian was doing with the camera and why. And thinking about that, at the same time, that didn't really help me with the acting. I mean, for the acting, you want to clear out everything else out of your head and just really be, you know, dealing with what's going on in the scene. But as the, the filmmaker in me was always kind of going, oh, look, he's got the camera kind of over there, and it's this kind of motion, and, you know. But I don't think, I, at least as a director, I don't feel like most actors focus on that. They may be curious about it or interested in it, but when they're busy doing the scene, it's really about the feelings and the other actor and, and, and what the scene is about. Yeah, I, I I was thinking along the lines of, I as an actor I've heard that you tend to calibrate your performance depending upon is it a close up, is it a medium shot, a master shot, uh, is is that the case or? I think that's true for for again I think you see seasoned veterans do that more. I mean certainly when I've directed people like somebody like Nick Nolte, he's very aware of you know what size the lens is, how big he is in frame, and does calibrate beautifully. And, and it really is. I mean, the ones that know what they're doing like that, it's amazing because it really helps you in the editing room because it flows so beautifully from close-up to wide shots, and you get the same level of emotion with them taking things up and down. Um, yeah. And But not all actors. I mean, actors, I mean, the thing about directing is that you learn every actor is unique. I mean, no two actors focus in the same way on the same thing. So for every Nulty who really was curious about, you know, what's the lens and how, but, you know, there are other actors who don't want to know, they don't want to think about it, they, you know, that's like, they, that, that's anything that will throw them off to know, and, and, and that's fine, too. But there is something wonderful about those actors, like a Nulty, who not only knows that he knows about lighting, you know, he'd look at the way we lit, lit a scene and would say, oh, what happens if I turn my face into the shadow here? Is that more interesting if you kind of only get half my face? And, you know, 99 times out of 100, he'd be right. Um, but but a lot of actors don't don't want to be thinking about that, and I think you just kind of roll with what helps them do their best work. And if they if the technical stuff helps them, then great. Um, but just as many don't want to think about that at all. So as an eager kind of student of film, working under De Palma, what were the what did you want to learn from him, and, and what were your conversations with him with him like? Well, it's you know the obvious thing that you brought up is that you know. Brian is a, is a master in terms of camera work and camera movement and, and, and creating shots and creating set pieces and sequences. So um, I think I probably asked him most, you know, about camera and lenses and light and, you know, why this shot, why this movement, what, you know, how much do you pre-plan. And, you know, I, I remember looking a lot at his storyboards. And he did these very silly little storyboards. They weren't, you know, they weren't elaborate or beautiful or anything. They were really stick figure but they really covered – I mean, you could see that for all the set piece sequences, how carefully he planned everything out. And it was interesting because people think, you know, of directors like Brian as being very, um, you know, complete control freaks. But there were actually scenes that were more dialogue scenes where he would see what the actors were doing and often adapt a camera movement to it or, or, or sort of let it come out of the scene itself. But the more complicated set piece sequences, you know, the, the murders, the chases, he really 
had every image down, even if they were just drawn in these little in these little stick figure sort of ways. And it was amazing how close he would stick to that, you know, even if it was months away from the scene being shot. Um, but I also was interesting to watch him calibrate the difference between that and, let's say, a scene where, you know, Nancy and I were just sitting on a couch talking. And he might have had a visual plan for that, but he also kind of watched what we were doing and I think factored that into what he was doing as opposed to, uh, you know, the chase through the subway or something, which was much more planned out in advance. I, I think he really, you know, changed his style depending a little bit on what the, the sequence was. I might be wrong about this, but I, I think I recall reading, um, I, I think Mr. De Palma was a, a kind of a computer geek. Uh, yes. And that, that kind of mirrored your character in the film. Did you have a sense well, that you were playing some version of De Palma? I was aware just from talking with Brian that it, actually in both of the movies and Dress to Kill, there were a lot of things out of his childhood. I mean, I never, I never actively tried to do Brian. I wasn't like doing a Brian De Palma imitation, nor did he ever encourage me that way. I don't think we ever talked about the character as, well, this was me, so be this way. Uh, I think he avoided that because I don't think he was trying to do himself as much as drawing on, as many writers and creator people do, drawing on his own experience. But yes. You know, I think a lot of the things from having the kind of the wacky family stuff that was in home movies to the computer geek stuff in, in, in Dress to Kill, a lot of that stuff I do know came out of his childhood. Uh, you know, his interest in devices and cameras and all that was him. So there, it, certainly there was a a little, you know, bit of the Antoine Donnell about, uh, Donnell about, about it all. But, but, yeah. but I think, I mean, he was pretty careful to never say, when I was a kid, I was this way. Because I don't think he wanted me doing an imitation. And that would have been for a young actor an easy trap to fall into. It was like, oh, I'm playing him. I should start, you know, looking at how he moves, how he walks, you know. And I think Brian was probably smart with somebody. I was only, whatever, 17 at the time, 18, whatever. Uh, you know, he was very good at helping me not fall into the traps that somebody that age would easily fall into. Yeah. Um, so he never made it, you know, this is me. Well, as a, as such a master technician, um, as he is as a filmmaker, uh, it t- people tend to overlook the performances in his films because yeah. they're so based by the camera work. Uh, how did he interact with the actors? How did he direct? I actually think it's one. Of, it's really one of the. Uh, over, I do feel like he's overlooked in that area. I mean, actually, I actually found Brian a wonderful director as an actor, and I, and I do think people never talk about that with him. Um, but I really enjoyed working with him. Um, he he actually left a good amount of freedom to the actors, uh, which again people wouldn't think of with somebody who is such a you know a master of control in terms of the camera. But but he didn't try to control the actors with that same tight fist. He he let us play. There was a certain amount of you know of improvisation with home movies. There was even and even on Dress to Kill, you know he had things blocked in his head a certain way. And I remember you know the, the scene with the computer. He was like, well you know I I, I think you're up and you're pacing because you've been up all night and. And I remember saying to him, you know, I just feel like if I've been up all night, maybe I'm a little more tired than that, and and it can be a little bit of a quieter conversation. And he kind of looked a little perturbed, like he wasn't sure about that. And then he kind of thought about it for a couple minutes. He went, okay, good, well, we'll do that, you know. And he we, he was he was very open, even with a, with me as such a young actor, and me sort of speaking up for what felt right or didn't feel right. Um, and he did a thing that I loved as an actor, and that I've tried to do as a director, which is that. Um, he'd do a decent number of takes, uh, and, and usually he'd get something good early on, and then he'd say, you know, okay, we've got it. You know, why don't we do one where you're a little bit more angry? Why don't we do one that's a little bit more silly? Why don't we, and, and he'd, he'd play a little bit. He'd do an extra few takes where he'd try some different things. Uh, and for an actor, that was wonderful, uh, to do because first of all, it was just fun, but also it gave you a great sense of confidence that you knew you had a safe one in the bank. Yeah. And that you could then try some things, and if they came out stupid and goofy instead of good, they wouldn't end up in the movie. Um, so it was very freeing. And you know, I think most actors have these ideas in their heads that oh, it wouldn't. Have, it might be cool if I did X, but you don't want to do it in case it comes off wrong or 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 bad, and that's what they use. And, and Brian set a, sta- a very safe kind of space for that, where it's like, okay, we've done sort of the the, the down the line one. Um, while we're here, let's do let's take a couple more checks, you know, wax at it and do something a little bit different. Uh, and that was a big lesson to me in, in for, for me as a director to be um, that what takes the time on a movie set is really setting everything up. Once you've got the lights and the camera and everything set, doing an extra take or two is really 
you know, that's not what takes the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also felt like, you know, Brian did the thing that every good director does, which is he worked differently with different actors, and he would adapt to what that actor responded to. Um, but I, I, you know, I certainly had the feeling that, you know, Michael Caine really enjoyed working with him, and, and, and I know that Nancy and I did, and I think Angie did. And, you know, he, he was very, um, you know, he was, he was quiet. He wasn't like your best buddy, boisterous, you know, guy, but he was very kind of thoughtful and present and would really listen if you talk to him and 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 he cared a lot about the performances uh and and again i think people overlook that because um the camera work is so smashing but you you know you look at somebody like angie and i think it's some of her best work uh you know in the in the second half of her career you know if not the best work um and and he really cared that he cared that we cared about that character and i think put a lot into working with her to make that character empathetic and and so that you know, when she does die, it is it is shocking and disturbing. Another area that is a perce- perception of him that I think is unfairly dismissive is the Hitchcock uh, comparison. Uh, in your view, how do you think he 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 takes that inspiration, and how do you think he transcends it in his thrillers? Well, you know, it's funny. Yeah, I used to feel bad about that because that was going on even at the time we were doing Jurassic Hill. And, and and it is inevitable because clearly he was inspired by Hitchcock, but everybody's inspired by somebody. You know, I mean, you know, and, and most filmmakers are inspired by a number of people. And, 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 you know, we all sort of steal from the best. And, and I don't think Brian would deny that. That I remember him once saying, you know, that talking about Hitchcock and saying that Hitchcock had really helped create a whole grammar in film of how do you do suspense and how you communicate, you know, a certain kind of fear and that, that you know, it would be crazy not to make use of that grammar because it was brilliant grammar, but that doesn't mean you're writing the same story just because someone has helped lay out, you know, the tricks of the language. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think it was a very, I, I, I feel it was an unfair thing, although inevitable, and, and, and in fact, you know, anybody makes a lot of, uh, any you know, if you do a lot of film in a certain genre, you're going to end up compared to somebody else in that genre. I mean, that just seems to be the way critics and Hollywood and every you know every everything is about comparison. So for somebody like Brian, who did work in a somewhat Hitchcockian way, in that he used images to tell a story, um, you know, he used often very lush scoring. He would he would let images tell the story, not dialogue. He did a lot of things that Hitchcock did. And so inevitably, after a few films, people were going to start going, hey, that's kind of like Hitchcock. You know, I'm sure there are, you know, whatever whatever genre you, you know, if he'd, if he'd concentrated on doing comedies, people would have started comparing him to whoever, you know, Howard Hawks' comedies in the 40s, and, you know, and or it's just it's just that thing that people love to do, which is find the connection. And, and, and the thing is, there, there's always some truth in it. Of course, we're all influenced by the people we grew up watching. I look at my films, and I see... The Palma, I see Stanley Kubrick, I see Martin Scorsese, I see, you know, I, I, I know who I've been influenced by, and I can see it in my own work, and I, I think true of any director, but because Brian worked in that same genre often of suspense, it became the kind of standard cliche thing to say about him, was that, you know, he, oh, he was, he was aping Hitchcock, um, which, you know, I think is, is kind of subverting the truth, which is that I think he was jumping off from some of the things that Hitchcock helped invent, but, but he certainly was very much making his own movies. When you're and you're obviously you're an accomplished director yourself now. I, I love all of your movies; they're terrific. And I, I told you in the email, I, I have a soft place in my heart for Waking the Dead. I, I, it, the movie moves me very much. Well, um, thank you. It's that's sort of my very favorite, and it's the one that's sort of closest to my heart. So it's really nice. When I hear that. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, but as an accomplished director yourself now, observing De Palma's work from that vantage point. How how have you observed his his growth uh, over the past thirty years since Dress to Kill? Well, it's interesting. I mean, Brian has continued. The thing that I love about Brian is that he's continued to experiment and push himself, and not just do the obvious stuff. You know, I mean, I mean, if you look at, I mean, I'm trying to think of his whole the whole body of work, but you know, uh, I mean, even up to even uh, what was the thing he just did about. Uh, Redacted. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, in doing doing essentially, you know, it was almost an experimental film at this mm-hmm. point in his career. I mean, I, I guess that's the thing that I admire about him because as much as he's he's thought of as a genre artist, and and yes, he 
he did a lot of work in that genre. The guy has done everything from from you know flat out comedy to gangster to, films and yeah yeah to you know I mean Scarface is a very different kind of movie. I mean that's certainly not you know I mean that kind of black comedy almost satirical. I mean you know Brian always had a very political satirical mind I yeah. think too, and I think that gets overlooked and. It's there in the suspense movies even, but you know you look at things like like Scarface or or Bonfire of the Vanities, which you know I know everybody like rips apart, but I think is unfairly maligned. I mean I don't know that it's it's a I don't know that it all works, but it certainly was an interesting attempt to do something again different and and commenting on society and you know casualties of war. You know uh, it was a very kind of I thought brave attempt to really you know get inside brains of soldiers and what that does to people. So I think he's somebody that. You know, he's, it's funny because he's seen as a genre director, and yet you look at the body of work, and for every genre movie, there's a movie that's absolutely not a genre movie. Um, or there's, you know, something that, yeah, okay, it has a suspense element, but, you know, I mean, this is a guy who's you know, going and directing, you know, Bruce Springsteen videos in his spare time. I mean, I think he just loved movies, and, and, and he continued to challenge himself, which, is great because I think a lot of people don't. I think a lot of people, as they get older, they settle into this is what I do, and they pay me to do it, and mm-hmm. you know, and and when Brian was busy doing, you know, at, at points in his career when he didn't need to, he was doing films that were that were different and chancy. I mean, he'd go, go and do Mission to Mars. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't think he'd ever done a flat out science fiction film before that, and you know, here he is doing a kind of philosophical, you know, yeah. two thousand one esque science fiction movie at what was already thirty plus years into his career. Um, so I think that's something that I really admire about him and continue to. I mean, he's sort of sort of said, screw this. I mean, he, I guess he's living almost exclusively in France these days, or at least was the last time we spoke. He was there almost all the time, and he was like, listen, if you know, if I'm not going to get appreciated in America, I'll live somewhere else. And right. uh, I'm sure with something like Redacted, there was a feeling of, look, if, if I can't make the movies I want to make for a lot of money, I'll make them for a little bit of money. But he seems to care more about doing what, speaks to him than doing, you know, what's going to make him rich and famous, and I and I always sort of admire that. Yeah, I never, I never understood uh, the, his how underappreciated he is. For anyone that loves movies, I mean, he, his films are pure cinema, and that's that's how they're designed. I um, think it's because maybe, and if I'm, you know, I think it's because he's not as obviously sort of a socially aware artist as somebody like a Scorsese whose films are much more clearly sort of social document. Now, the funny thing is, I think Brian's films are actually very political, and I think yeah. he's always in his own way commenting on society and our politics and our, and, our, and how we interact and what, how, what we do and what our government does. But, but because I think it's often hidden a little bit more in the beauty of the cinema that he's doing or the dark sense of humor that he does it with or that I think that he doesn't get that that attention the same way. I also think, and it's that sad thing we do, I think he got pigeonholed early on um, as not a serious filmmaker in quite the same way as as some of his contemporaries like Scorsese or Coppola or whatever. And, you know, and once that pigeonholing happened, I think often people didn't look at his work with the same level of seriousness that it deserved. And that's just, again, one of the unfair things that you see happen all the time with criticism in in America. You see, you know, whatever, whether actors, directors, novelists, you know, once everybody decides, oh, this is who they are, Mm -hmm. sometimes they spend the rest of their career being seen through that prism, whether or not that makes any sense at all. They can they can be uh, typecast just as much as an actor can. Absolutely, and I think Brian is maybe one of the best examples of a director being typecast in people's minds. You know, for work that he did in the first ten years of his career, and never get, quite getting past that in terms of people's perception. Um, in you know, in, in, in an almost absurd way, when you look at you know, when you look at the body of work, when you look at the Untouchables, and you look at you know, I mean, most of his most noted work isn't in that genre. That's the funny thing. Uh, you know, Mission Impossible is not is not a you know kind of low budget y feeling suspense piece, and yet when people think of him, they still have that old image, and 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 that's what everybody goes to. And and I'm sure it must drive him a little bit nuts. Although he also has a good enough sense of ask screw everybody, I'm going to do what I want. That maybe he doesn't even care. But but I'm amazed when I talk about him how much people still see him, you know, as the guy who did carry. You know, that's that's what's sort of stuck in everybody's brain. Um, well, I also think that. 
with the thriller genre, and I think I read a quote from him from years back, he said that this genre is tailor-made for the kind of visual filmmaking I, I want to do. And it it does allow him to kind of seep in his subversive uh, political kind of themes that he wants to yeah. explore. Yes, yeah, and, and let's face it, the suspense, and, suspense and horror both have often been used. I mean, whether you know, mm-hmm. uh, for, for as ways for people to sneak in kind of subversive ideas and do it in a way that kind of you can still you can still have a commercially successful movie, but if you look closely, you're really saying some very interesting things about the world around you. So I'm sure that was true, and I do think that that's true that 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 the suspense world gave him the freedom to do the kind of visual operatic visual stuff he wanted to yeah. do. But he brought that same touch. To Scarface, he brought the same touch to Untouchable. I mean, it didn't have to be the kind of more. Well, it does, it, he brought it to everything he did, really. I mean, you know, if you think about his work, uh, I mean, even Get to Know Your Rabbit opens with that insane, whatever it is, seven minute long shot from the ceiling looking down over the set, moving from room to room. I mean, it's 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 one of those remarkable shots I've ever seen, and it was on a little tiny low budget comedy. So, yeah, I'm sure. That the suspense genre let him do it to its fullest, but all of his films, you know, I, he had a great command of what, what the, the visuals were doing. And even if he decided to tone it down, I mean, if I think of a film like, say, Wise Guys or something, you know, where, where the style was, that became almost a stylistic statement. Because here's a guy who is, you know, he, who, who does use style in such sort of a florid, operatic way, and the choice to do something more simply became its own experiment in terms of his work. Yeah. Well, what do you what do you find in Dress to Kill that he that he is exploring? What are, what are those ideas or themes? Well, you know, obviously there's a whole. I mean, it's, it's a very sexual film, and it's a film a lot about you know, sort of the what is our, what is sexuality? Um, and you've got Angie's character, you know, having a this horrible sex life, and then sort of finally having this one wonderful affair. And, you know, and then ironically getting killed. And, I, and it, it's funny because people jumped on that at the time and they they kind of blamed Brian for making this kind of anti-feminist statement of that, oh, see, she enjoys sex, so she has to be punished. And, you know, it's if you read the script, which you know, I don't know if I, I might have it somewhere or if you can get a copy from Brian, it's, it's so obvious. I mean, the script, is, it's fascinating. He writes a lot of the first third of the script sort of from almost in first person. In fact, I wonder if he did do something in first person, or, or if it's not. I mean, you're literally inside the Angie Dickinson character's head. I mean, the script you're talking about, I mean, he's writing things you're never going to see on screen about what she's thinking about and what she's feeling uh, in, in great detail. It's almost novelistic. And so well, you, you, so, you, you so feel that in the museum, all the way leading up to when she's murdered in the elevator. You are inside her head. You're experiencing all the emotions that, that she's feeling. Absolutely, and that's why I always felt that the, the knock on it for being, you know, oh yeah, she has sex and so she's punished was was a very kind of silly knee jerk reaction because I, I, you know, if you read the script, it was so clear that he was empathetic with her and that yeah, there's a terrible, sad irony to the fact that here's this woman who finally like has a good sexual experience after in, in a marriage without that and she gets you know VD and killed within you know five minutes, but I never felt he was saying she deserved it and that was a leap that. I understand people taking because there had been an, an idea that, that, that female sexuality was in some way frightening to people and couldn't be dealt with, but I, I certainly don't think that, that was Brian's intent. Um, you know, and then that just goes through the whole film. I mean, everything in the film sort of has this odd, you know, it's all full of dualities and mirrors and, and, and who are we really versus who we think we are. And, uh, you know, it's very obvious in the Michael Caine character, but, but it goes through everybody. I mean, there's Nancy Allen's character who's, you know, who's selling sex, but and in a way is very unsexual. I mean, she's she's doing it professionally, and she's very sexy. But she's somebody who, if you you know, doesn't seem to have any kind of romantic life, doesn't seem to have any any sort of, of her own sexuality. She's just there as a character, you know, in her life who kind of fulfills other people's sexual needs. Um, so everybody in the film has got a weird sort of, you know, they're trying to. Their, their sexuality is, is somehow misplaced or, or 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 isn't formed, you know. I mean, even in my own character, I mean, the, you know, naming the character Peter is, I, you know, I mean, I don't think there's an, I don't think that's an accident. Uh, I don't think it was just coincidence, um, you know. When Angie says, you know, I'll tell your grandmother you're working on your Peter, and you know, and, and having this kind of early adolescent character who, you know, is just becoming sexual and the weird sort of almost slightly flirty stuff with, 
Nancy Allen, which is never going to lead anywhere, but it's kind of unspoken and it's there. And yeah. you know, so that there's it just runs through everybody in the film is kind of not sure of their place and and trying to find who they are, except maybe Dennis Franz, and he's he's sort of the outsider in, the, in it all. You know, he's the one who's like sort yeah. of looking in from the outside. And of um, course, the mo- the most obvious of the of the conflicted sex sexuality is is the Michael Caine character. Oh well, yeah, and the Michael Caine character is done very clearly. I mean, in the use of mirrors and the fact that you know the mirror really becomes this mirror image of himself, mm-hmm. and and the use of of the you know other actor playing the other side of him, you know, quite literally in terms of Susanna Clement, you know, and and um, you know the, the fact that that he's so fractured by his sexuality that that he's literally different people in the film. Um, you know, but but what but what's interesting when you look at the film is how that really extends to the other characters in more subtle ways. I mean, he's the major chord version of that, but then there are these little, you know, sort of harmonies going along with it with everybody else in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so and, and and so I feel like the camera work in some ways is, is affected by that, both the idea of dualities, but also the idea of sort of people searching for themselves and finding themselves. And there's something about the camera that to me is always searching in the movie. And again, I, I could be talking out of my hat because I don't remember asking Brian about this specifically, and he could hear this and say, "Oh, that's complete nonsense." But, but I always feel like, with you know, the museum sequence again being the obvious, you know, very on the nose version of it. But even a lot of other scenes, it's like the camera's slowly moving as if it's trying to find. Well, you know, what what's the truth here? What's the angle here? What's the? You know, it's it's very rarely like presented in a in a, in a, st- a still way of okay, here's what is. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of time where where it's either moving or something else in the frame is taking you away from where you should be. Um, you know, everything's split. I mean, even the split diopter stuff with, you know, in the, in, in the windows in the world in the World Trade Center, you know, when, when Nancy's telling me about having a panectomy while, while um, you know, in the background. Um, Mary Davenport, he's sitting in the background, you know, freaking out. So even there, you know, you've got this split screen and a split reality and two different people's split reactions to something sexual and, so it's, it's like sort of all through the movies, and, and, and obviously in Michael Caine's case, it, it's right on the surface, but it's it's there there almost throughout. Yeah, I know you're you have to be biased because you're you're in Dress to Kill, but uh, do you have a, a a favorite De Palma film? Or? Well, I have a few. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I, I love Dress to Kill. You know, and, and obviously, yeah, I, I don't think you can ever be be completely objective about something you work on. But I mean there's a number of his films that I that I kind of adore and love and go back to and I mean I, I, I do think I think Scarface is an amazing movie. Um and I love the dark humor of it and the multi layeredness of it. Um yeah. you know, Carrie obviously I think is, is is pretty much a classic. Um uh you know, I, I there there are I actually think Obsession is a really cool movie. You know, I, I, you know, I mean, you know, some of his movies, it's like, it's like you can, you can criticize, and I understand the criticisms people have, but like, I don't care. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's true. Maybe that's over the top, but this is, you know, um, you know, Untouchables is certainly great. Um, uh, I thought Casualties of War was was severely underrated. Um, mm-hmm. I actually think Blowout is a really good film. I really like Blowout a lot. Um, Blowout, Blowout is actually my favorite. If 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 you had a gun to my head, I'd say Blowout. <laughs> it would it would be way up there for me too. I mean, I think that's one of the cases where he best combined style and acting and theme and 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 everything. And I, and I think the ending of that movie is really is really affecting. Um, you know, I think that it's a film that you know it not only takes you on a on an adrenaline kind of ride, but it also takes you on a, on a truly emotional ride, and, and I think it's been a very, very effective movie, and and, and, and one that, that was sort of overlooked both at the time and now, um, but I, you know, that's a movie that I, I still find myself recommending people go and, and check out and, and see. You know, um, and you were talking about, it was the same thing we're, we were talking about with Angie Dickinson's character, uh, in terms of Carrie. I, I think Carrie works as well as it does, because we so empathize with Carrie. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, Brian had a thing. If you think, I think if you look at his work, he has a a sense of connection with outsiders. I mean, that's. I mean, I, I mean, if you're going to be really like high school about it and like try to break it down, that's the theme that I see running through. Whether it's comedy or or tragedy or suspense or you know, and whether whether it's whether it's you know Tony Mattia and Scarface, whether it's Angie and, and I mean, he takes people that that 
in some way are uncomfortable in the place that they're in or not fitting in and identifies with them. Um, you know, and, and that's something that I think runs through, you know, I'm sure there are exceptions. I mean, I mean, I don't know if you could say that about Mission Impossible, but then again, Mission Impossible is a case where I really think he was a director doing a job. You know, he was, he was probably being paid a lot of money and, and I think he did it brilliantly, but he was, you know, I don't think that was his project in the same way. I don't think of that as a Brian film in the same way, even though it's really well made. But when I think of the films that seem more personal, that, that being drawn to the outsider, being drawn to a character that you might ordinarily either not identify with or not like or just think was weird or, or dismiss or be repelled by, and taking that person and in spite of yourself having you respond to them really goes through his work, I mean, you know, back to the early comedies. I mean, you know, he's taking care of, you know, those characters could have been really unlikable if they weren't acted so well and handled so well. Um, and, and, and I think that, that it's funny because people talk about all the camera work and all that, but I think there's a deeper emotional theme that runs through Brian's film than the fact that he's cool with moving the camera. And that is, it does seem to be that, you know, that, that understanding of that person who doesn't fit in trying to find their place, uh, yeah. even if it's in wildly different contexts. Okay, Keith Gordon with us tonight to talk about Dress to Kill. It's an interesting perspective because this is an actor that started with De Palma who is now a director who has learned from De Palma. So you, you kind of get a double kind of perspective on what yeah. his work means. Uh, and he was so so generous with us, so generous with his time. And another half hour of our interview will be coming up later on in the month where he talks about all of his directing work, which I know a lot of people are anxious to hear about because he's a great director. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Uh, and he expressed it there, that what uh, John Kenneth Muir was talking about, the difference in the theme of Dress to Kill, the difference between what you see and what is real. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, our final interview for the night, Nancy Allen returns and she'll be she was here last night to talk about Carrie. She'll be here tomorrow night to talk about Blowout. But tonight, obviously she's here to talk about Dress to Kill. And we all know and love Nancy Allen for these films and Robocop, the Robocop trilogy. Mm -hmm. Uh and a lot of great films and great filmmakers that she's collaborated with over the years. Here she is, the second part of our Nancy Allen interview. Are you good at watching yourself on on screen? Uh, not really, no. Um, not really. I'm highly critical of myself and think I'm awful most of the time. <laughs> I hear that a lot uh, yeah. among actors, but yeah. It's hard sometimes to get a little bit of a distance. I, in the past, I think that, um, you know, in Carrie, we were all just so elated and loved everything and it was all so great. But I think it's best for me to just See a little bit. I kind of like to just sort of get a look and get an idea of what something looks like and the feel of it, um, because uh, it's better for me not to watch myself. And generally, um, I think, oh, I could have tried this, I could have tried that. And then when I have some distance on mm -hmm. the film, I can look and go, oh, you know what, that I kind of like that. That's interesting. Uh, however, as we mature, we would make different choices. So I can't look at what I did at 25 or 30 and think that I would make the same choices today. So it, it's yeah. kind of pointless. <laughs> well, they're like, when you have a body of work like you do, um, and we've discussed this in the past with actors, they're like your own personal home movies in a way. If you go back and watch them from so many years ago, you can place yourself in that time that you were in as you were making them. Yes, you can. Yeah. Ironically, your next movie with De Palma was Home Movies. <laughs> Yes. What a segue! I, like that movie. I, like that. I do like that movie a lot. Um, <laughs> really? Yeah. It's it's a very obviously very quirky film. Oh yeah, definitely. But it's it's fun. I like it. Yeah, and we we talked to Keith Gordon uh, about home movies, and of course you also worked with him on on Dress to Kill. Yeah. And he had something interesting to say about Dress to Kill, and that the movie. It's clearly about all these characters and their their sexual identity. Uh, so I'm wondering your take on that, the themes that are dealt with in, in the film Dress to Kill. Well, he's looking at it from a writer-director's 
perspective, mm-hmm. um, you know, which is Keith has always been very cerebral and that kind of, even when he was a kid on home movies, he had a, a, a visual of certain things and ideas. I, you know, I, I don't know that I, I don't go into that much depth about the whole theme of it. Uh, certainly when you say it, it resonates. You think, of course, yes, everybody's sexual identity. Everybody had some sort of sexual thing going on, <clears throat> with the exception of Keith's character. I didn't pick up anything in his character. Maybe he saw it differently, but to me, he's just, he's more the, the narrator. He's the observer, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I guess so, sure. I mean, for me, it, my character, it was, you know, a means to an end, and uh, uh, certainly a control somewhere where she could feel in control of her life. Do you mind if I take off my coat? No. And the rest, too? Now, why would you want to do a thing like that? Well, because of the size of that cock in your pants. I don't think you're so married. Well, what do you think? I think you're a very attractive woman. Would you like to touch me? Uh, yes and no. Yes, because I'm... Well, why don't you? I told you why. Oh, that's right. You're a married doctor. I remember now. I think you're full of shit. You do. Just because I happen to have personal and professional ethics. Look, Doc. I think you're kind of shy. So, uh... I'm going to go powder my nose, and when I come back, I hope to find your clothes right next to mine. And if not, we can just get back to the mind phone. So tell, tell me about the, the how you developed Liz for the film. Well, let's see. Um, unbeknownst to me, uh, Brian was writing that movie the first was it when we were already married? I think it was when we had just got married. He was right working on that film. Yeah, he was writing it. <clears throat> and he would just read it to me as he was going along. And um, really, it was great. You know, every day I get to hear a new installment. And it was only at the end that I knew that he had actually written that part with me in mind. So at that point, I started to think about a couple things. And he and I obviously worked very closely on it. Um, I had a had met a woman earlier in my life when I was about twenty one. I'd met her. It was my first trip to Europe and she was a she was a model. She did mostly catalog modeling like Montgomery Ward and she was a very all American, beautiful brunette girl uh, from Ohio and <clears throat> she was kind of traveling around Europe and based in Paris like I was and she was always being flown here and given these lovely, expensive gifts, and I'm thinking, what's wrong with me? Why am I getting less chocolate? And anyway, <laughs> you know, when we got, I got to know her a little better, her ambition in life was she wanted to be somebody's mistress, and huh. uh, she just wanted to be taken care of, and she liked the goodies and all that. I thought, oh, how interesting, how very interesting. So I, re- I kind of thought about her when I read this, especially... Um, you know, the way the character was written. And I think I can't, you know, it's a lot of time is sometimes, uh, I don't know whether what I remember here, but I do recall us talking about the thing about the stock market. And then <clears throat> I think it might have been Brian who suggested I read the Nancy Friday books. There was one, um, I don't even remember what it was called, but it was all these women's sexual fantasies. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it was all about, the, you know, the unknown the, un- the faithless stranger, 
you know, there was one, uh, I, I remember the one story in the book called The Zipless Fuck, and I thought, oh, you know, very provocative. And all these women's mm-hmm. fantasies was all about, you know, just being basically raped or overtaken in some way by the man. And we used that concept for the fantasy in the office when she tells us her dream. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that all of these pieces, doing that little bit of reading, thinking, drawing on her, um, and I think probably using my own awareness of, of how sexuality, my own sexuality could affect a man, like men are very visual, you know, just a little mm-hmm. bit of that. And it was a very well-written character, so it's not like I had to do a lot of deep, heavy work on it. Um, so, yeah, pretty much, pretty much that's it. And I think once you get in, you get in some of those clothes, you start to feel a little bit different. At least I do. Wardrobe's very instrumental for me. Mm-hmm. Right, right. That does bring up a couple of uh, questions uh, of, about his films o- overall, particularly in this genre. Uh, the the way he deals with sexuality, uh, I mean, it is very provocative and daring. Um, did, did you feel that? Did you feel like you guys were doing something that that took it right up to the edge with these films like Dress to Kill? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, if you read the script, it's right there. It's very provocative. And, yeah. um, you know, um, I didn't really think much about that, honestly, uh, except when I read it, I thought, such a great script. It's like, you could see the movie. You knew it was going to be a good movie. Mm-hmm. Now, I think that I personally was maybe a little bit unprepared for all the the brouhaha when it first opened about mm-hmm. all of it, the, mm-hmm. uh, the women and people. You know, I don't know. I mean, you're probably pretty young, but there was a lot of um, controversy, yeah. which, of course, was fabulous for the movie. People were talking about it. But... Um, yeah, I mean, definitely there were themes in there and things. There was stuff actually that was shot, which I'm sure you'll talk to him about, that was never used in the movie. So yeah, particularly the opening. And, and it did uh, it, it did have trouble getting through the ratings board. Mm-hmm. Uh, I understand from talking to to Mr. Lido for the series, and um, also I think it was more for the violence than the sexuality. You think so? I thought that's what I remember. I this is my memory. It shows you, like I said, everybody's memory is different. Um, I remember the biggest problem being the elevator scene, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And having to cut down the violence in that. And and in my opinion about that at the time was that it was it was really unnecessary in that. For me, it was so effective in watching it just her vulnerability and just the idea of mm-hmm. seeing the razor and seeing her back into the corner. I almost didn't need to see anything else. Mm-hmm. It was just that was horrible. Yeah. So, um, but I, that's what I remember. He had to cut that twice, but I could be wrong about that, George. Just, you know, that's interesting because it's changed over the years. It's more for sex now, like sexual sexual themes in movies and scenes in movies. At the ratings, the violence doesn't even seem to really phase anyone. It's really the sex we're still hung up on. Yeah, but remember, we came, we were coming out of the 60s and 70s, mm-hmm. and everybody was naked and running around. Oh, that's and true. There was so much of that then. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> of course, I, I would have to say that I thought that the the shower scene in the beginning, the fantasy, Angie's fantasy, was mm-hmm. very provocative. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And it is unique, too, because we're we're dealing with, in Angie Dickinson's character, kind of an older woman. And her coming to terms with kind of a revived sense of sexuality, mm-hmm. which is so unique for uh, particularly for this genre of movie, and and of course your characters as well are very unique for this genre. What are your impressions of of how he does portray women in in, in these films? <coughs> hmm. <laughs> Interesting mm. question. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Well, let's see. Um, well, I like the idea of exploring women's sexuality. Why not? We've explored plenty of men's sexuality. It's kind of interesting to do that. Um, I guess 
in retrospect, to think that, you know, the character, the Liz character, her sexuality was either, uh, I mean, she was a prostitute. We don't really know anything about her other than she's a kind of a money-growing <laughs> prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the Angie character is the, you know, the bored housewife who's, husband and you know i mean i just you know i don't know i don't know uh i mean certainly that's that's part of the shell of a woman there's a lot more going on but it's a good those are good and provocative characters for that kind of movie i guess i don't know yeah i guess what i'm what i'm getting at is one of the main criticisms about about his films and i think it actually might have started around body double but mm-hmm. it, it is cries of misogyny yeah, that's what. Yeah, they were boy. They were all over me on the press when on the press tour, mm-hmm. huh. <laughs> and calling him a misogynist. And <clears throat> and um, you know, I um, t- rent, uh, defended him like crazy. And uh, you know, I mean, certainly love is a little blind, and um, there certainly is certainly some of there, some of that in there. Uh, you can't deny it. Actually, I mean, I can't now. I mean, I'm not love is blind anymore. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm a, I'm a mature woman at this point, and uh, yeah, I mean, you certainly do see that they're um, a little bit weensy, weensy, bit objectified, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, not exactly whole people, like a real whole person there. Well, let me let me get off misogyny for a little bit and get to Michael Caine. <laughs> Uh, okay. what, what, what was that experience like, working across from him? <clears throat> I would have to say amazing. He's uh, obviously a terrific actor. Um, I was, you know, really, I mean, I grew up watching his movies, and uh, I was very, very nervous the first day of rehearsal, mm-hmm. having to read that scene with him. And, and um, <clears throat> he put me at ease with just a few words. With and some humor, which was very helpful. <laughs> but I would say, I love to tell this story because <clears throat> I think it's, I've heard so many stories about, you know, actors, uh, successful actors who uh, are not very generous and who aren't, they don't stay around for, you know, the other side, the you know, the, the turnaround of the camera and right. somebody else read the lines. and. And when we shot that scene of my telling the dream, you know, I'm walking back and forth and all there, all the way around the office, the way we were in a really small studio space and the where the camera was set and where I had to look and where everybody had to stand, there really was no place for him to be right by camera where I normally would be looking for him. And as you know, I do all the talking and he just goes, hmm, really, hmm, you know, there's really nothing that he says. So Brian invited him to go back to his dressing room and wait while we shot the scene. And he said, no, I think I'll stay here because he, she'll she'll know. She'll feel. She'll know that I'm in the room. And I just thought that was, you know, you know, quite a, a generous act on his part. And this wasn't the thing where I'm just taking the clothes off and, you know, with show and tell, here's the lingerie. This was just the acting piece. So I never forgot that. And, um, you know, I always appreciate it because it did make a difference to feel him in the room and know that he was mm-hmm. there. 